Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to the inaugural function of SOIFX Foundation and the subsequent panel discussion. The foundation has been formed by a group of treasury professionals who had been identified and trained by a bank leadership over 25 years back. Most of them have branched out of that particular institution and then to head various organizations and treasuries nationally as well as internationally. They have had global acclaim for the treasury expertise. So the, all of them have come together to provide a platform as SYFX Treasury Foundation with an objective to simplify FX and import training and to bridge the skill gap in the financial markets in general and FX markets in particular. It is a proud moment for the foundation to be associated with NSE, the leading stock exchange in the country and the second largest in the world. It is indeed appropriate for me to request Mr. Vikram Limaye, the Managing Director and CEO of the National Stock Exchange, to set the proceedings with a welcome address. Vikram, a Wall Street veteran and a Wharton alumni, Vikram is known for his expertise in various facets of the market, be it investment banking, capital markets or structural finance. Over to Mr. Vikram for his welcome address. Thank you, Mr. Tyagrajan, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Former Deputy Governor of RBI, Mrs. Usha Thorat, Mr. Samba Murthy, Honorable Chief Economic Advisor, Dr. Subramanian, who should be joining us shortly, Mr. Mahalingam, all time member SEBI, Mr. Padmanabhan, and other dignitaries. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the inaugural function of SYFX Treasury Foundation and the panel discussion following the event. An important aspect of uh, financial reforms is the development of a pool of human resources having the right skills and expertise. And in this regard, NSE has always been at the forefront of empowering and educating the investor and the financial markets landscape. NSE aims to cultivate a culture of knowledge to help investors take informed decisions. And in this regard, we are glad to associate with SYFX Treasury Foundation in their endeavor to facilitate learning for everyone connected with the global financial markets. It is commendable to see a set of professions who branched out of an institution to regroup themselves after 25 years with an idea of giving back to society. I'm sure that with the kind of proven expertise that the foundation has, they would contribute immensely to the overall development of the financial markets in general and the FX markets in particular. I congratulate Mr. Samba Murthy for his mentorship to SYFX Treasury Foundation and extend a warm welcome to him. I also extend a warm welcome to the president of this function, Ms. Usha Thorat. Her contribution to the regulatory framework over the decades has been immense, and we are fortunate to have her guidance on this occasion. Based on the recommendations of the RBI task force headed by Mrs. Thorat, we have launched the INR USD derivatives contracts in NSE International Exchange in Gift City, Gandhinagar, recently. We will be working closely with the foundation and will take their guidance in building the INR USD market at Gift City. I also extend a warm welcome to the chief guest of the evening, Dr. Subramanian. He has been at the forefront of providing thought leadership in steering the economy through difficult times. We are delighted that we have Mr. Mahalingam, who has been associated with all the regulatory efforts at RBI and SEBI for the last more than three decades for the cause of market development. I'm privileged to welcome Mr. Padmanabhan, former non-executive chairman, Bank of India, and former ED, Reserve Bank of India, to this function. I also welcome Anand, moderator of the panel, and the panelists, Sajid, Adarsh, Samir, and Pranjal. I'm sure the financial market community is uh, eager to hear the deliberations of the panel and the ideas and insights that would emerge from the discussion. Once again, I extend my best wishes to the Foundation's activities and thank everyone for participating in this event. Dr. Subramanyam, welcome to the event. Thanks, Vikram. We are the SYFX Treasury Foundation. Very good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces here. Madam Thorat is here. Samamurthy, sir. Wish you all very good. Now, after the welcome address, I'm just moving towards a mentor address. Now, I let me request Mr. B. Samamurthy to deliver his mentor address. There is an old HR saying which goes, when people are financially invested, they want returns. When people are emotionally invested, they want to contribute. I think there is no better occasion than this to demonstrate the correctness of this power. We are experiencing that now. 
Mr. Bhutti is known for his 3P approach, people, process, and product. All of us have been the beneficiaries of his visionary thinking. Can you ever believe that he was the first one to think about how the internet would change the Indian banking? Probably 25 years back, Syndicate Bank was the first bank to have had its website and possibly the first bank to have had core banking solution. So we have all worked with him for 25 years back. But even now, we are emotionally and intellectually connected with him. The formation of the foundation itself is an answer to his pertinent question. When he asked, what have you guys who have collective experience of more than 1,000 years have contributed to this nation? The foundation is the answer to his question. Over to Mr. P. Sambamurti, the man who thinks ahead of his time and possibly makes a big positive impact on the entire ecosystem. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Tagarajan, for kind words. I don't know whether I deserve it or not. Let me formally welcome our esteemed Chief Economic Advisor, Dr. Subramanian. But when I just sent a mail that, that uh, we are trying to establish a foundation, this educative object went all as you to inaugurate. It would be the fitness of things if he inaugurates. I sent a mail, I thought I need to follow it up in the evening. I don't have, I didn't have to wait till the evening. In fact, in just two hours he said, just sure, please go ahead and ask your team to be in touch with him. Very grateful, thanks to you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule. You can imagine the kind of you know demands on your time. It's very trying time, so I'm damn sure you navigate. Uh, the country out of these problems and all that. Welcome to all ladies and gentlemen for joining this very momentous occasion. So there can't be better probably people in whose present this is inaugurated. Mrs. Sushat Thorat, former Deputy Governor, two former Executive Directors, Mr. Padmanabhan and Mr. Mahalinga. Of course, they also donned other positions. Former Chairman of Bank of India and Mr. Mahalingam is currently full-time member of SEBI. These three luminaries of Reserve Bank of India, now we have seen it as Chagaraz has said over the last 25 years, they have navigated products markets for very turbulent times. We have seen, in fact, I was working in London in 1990 where almost every day Reserve Bank used to ask us for our liquidity statement, not bank, find out what is my surplus? Even if there's half a million surplus, there is to be celebrated. That's kind of times we have seen. These luminaries, let me tell you all the three of them, I've seen them very closely, have developed the forex market to a scale and sophistication that we see today. They have struck a nice balance between development and regulation. I'm not basing simply because they are there, because I've known them very well. And I'm sure they should they'll be very happy to see the kind of forex markets that we have developed country today. Thank you, Mrs. Thoret, Mr. Padmanabhan, Mr. Mahi, for your contribution to the development of forex markets in India. So it's only appropriate, we said, Mr. Jagarajan said, we should have both of them because this is related to forex. Well, I'm not a born forex man, let me, let me confess. In fact, I, before I came to forex, I was in UP, which is predominantly agricultural, where we are trying to experiment production link, the housing schemes and all that. So after finishing my tenure in what was supposed to be called a very tough region, they asked me where you want to go. I said I want to try my hands in forex. They asked me why forex. In initial years after I joined Syndicate Bank, I think early 80s or late 70s, when I visited head office, there were two big trophies at the entrance of the podium of the head office. I asked them what these trophies are. They said one is a national award for contribution of Syndicate Bank exports in forex. And the other trophy, the same year, at the same time, was the appreciation of syndicate banks' contribution to agriculture. So, I don't think there can be better motivation or inspiration to work in either of the areas. That's how I was attracted to this Forex division. So, having come to the Forex division in the initial few days, they said, okay, sit in front of the screen, then you, you learn a lot of things in the crucible and all. So, I sat there, I had a few lessons from my senior. Then when I sat on the screen and then trying to understand, trying to interpret what happens in the these are the lessons. I don't So I, I remember that one of those days 
that was the mpc of bank of england the governor of bank of england had just come out of the meeting ms got to the meeting and the pound fell there were no even announcement of the numbers of what the mpc was about i asked them what that what is the signal you have there is no data they said bank of england governor pitched his eyes high bro so he was very unhappy <laughs> they said they did tell me this lesson in my class after few days i still remember that the hans kaitmar what this bank was then phenomenal guy he also had a mpc meeting he emerged out of mpc meeting he said he was very calm while emerging out of the meetings no data there was a long positions in the market i had asked him what is that he said there is not going to be any change in the interest rates and all that so be happy and then go long and and then after a few days there was this green span coming out of a mpc meeting another mpc mpc meeting and then he addressed the media and then the dollar was going up like anything and asked him why what happened i told him that they asked me what did green span speak my boss asked me he said all that i know is he spoke english or nothing else i have understood what he spoke then see people have interpreted have made a lot of money he said he is not he is there is what is called green span put is trying to reduce the interest rate markets went haywire so i was little confused how do you understand this forex market i went back to my boss and asked him sir tell me some, give me some tips how to understand we have a lot of experience because our chagaraj and said about experience 1000 years experience which probably i provoked them in fact to be very frank with you and then provocation has resulted in a very positive things of course i sounded mr padbar avan that uh, we are trying to do like that but avan said just he said okay i think in two minutes or three minutes he just gave a reply and we are don't worry you go ahead so i asked him sir that whatever is happening in the market is exactly opposite of what i have learned in the classroom and all that so how do i get this experience and all that so i thought for a while and he said the forex markets are like vedas or vedas i asked him what is the connection between our vedas and forex markets sir he said vedas have got two parts one is samhitas that is mantras samhitas that is mantras second is brahmanas it's not about born brahmins let me tell you there is no caste or religion in this issue and asked him what is brahmanas brahmanas are the people who can interpret what is happening in the market so he said first of all you need to understand how to interpret not only the data but also the body language and features of the governors when they come up and also if you have people like greenspan also be thorough with english what he says and what he meant what he did not mean and if you get it correctly you will make money i was wondering myself luckily sashi tarur is not the governor of reserve bank of india otherwise we would have lot of trouble in understanding what he would say so this is my then i realized this important and then he said brahmana said basically the interpretation that you gain from a lot of experience and then try to understand interpret that you will make money then he also cautioned me there are super brahmanas i asked him, where are they they are in the hill street be careful their interpretation and purpose is final otherwise you will be troubled because those days there was fear i am telling you sharing with you the importance of experience mr chagaraj and i said and i myself to be very frank with you i have not a forex veteran veteran and a lot of dealers were leaving syndicate bank so because they are all picked up by prudential banks and foreign banks now so one day we left with one just dealer can you imagine running a book then i thought i i myself and you i just came then how to find out these people of course i had three years run at london by the time i just come here then hr i said we need to probably train a pipeline dealers i said not one two every batch there should be 15 there should be three concurrent batches ask me the syndicate bank need i said yes because i know most of them out of them 30 will leave sometime to foreign banks i said we should not grudge contribute to the system this country i said that char i fought with them and and then said the qualification for anyone to start with this they need not know dollar sign or pound sign but they have an open and chagarajan for your information was a rural development officer in dindigal before he came to bombay am i right so chagarajan so also he 
He headed Forex of RIL, it's one of the largest corporates. We have Venkatesh, global head treasury of TCS. So I am proud of whatever they have achieved. So after 25 years, I said, you know, let's do something what we can give back to the society. At least in the area of knowledge, if not contributing money, I think this is more that we do. So, I mean, come to this members group, I was having a look at the profile of the members, especially the core group. Most of them have just retired or on the verge of retirement. Then somebody would ask, are you fellows, is all retired, is a pastime or what? Then I said, it's not a pastime of anyone. Then I realized that somebody told me the most productive years for individually 60 to 70, second most productive is 70 to 80, and the third most productive surprisingly is 50 to 60. So I assured myself, I assured all the team members, we are in the most productive. This is attributed to a New England Journal of Medicine. I don't know whether it is true or not. Then at least we have a reassurance that we are in this thing. Another finished Mrs. Jagarajan, just close. So I can assure the, probably the stakeholders that it's not merely experience, but there is also energy. But normally those days conventional wisdom was, there is too much of experience, energy level below, but this is experience plus energy. And this experience in the crucible of forex market and almost all of them have worked at, in a, at abroad with fine colors they've done. And finally, even then when it is told me, sir, 60, 70, 70, 80 are the most productive and said, I think John Goodview won Nobel Prize for his lithium research in 2019. He was 97 when he won the Nobel Prize. Somebody asked him, you are still going to the lab at this age? And he replied, retirement does not mean waiting to die. So I think you can't have better inspiration than these kind of guys. We have in our own country great people like Dr. Rangarajan. When he calls me for any meeting, chit chat, I have to read two days before I meet him. At the 87, such clarity of thought, such commitment. I think we also have, I think we don't recognize them. So with these few words, what I said is forex markets have grown in size, grown in sophistication, also grown in complexity. So it is necessary for all the market participants to update, upgrade continuously their skills. Also MSME, especially the sector which contributes a large amount of exports, also need some kind of guidance and help. So I think this is where the the foundation is going to be petitioned to be this thing. Along the way, we are also going to have collaborations and partnerships to so that we deliver some of the best experience, best probably contemporary knowledge to all the participants. These few words, I will stop here. Once again, grateful thanks to our chief advisor, Dr. Subramanian, who has so kindly agreed. Also, Dr. Mr. Padmanavan, Mr. Mahalingam, for sparing their time, and Mr. Lidmele for posting it. He came forward immediately first because we are in a virtual mode, very frankly. And this group has just done it in about 40 days' time. They incorporated a company. They have come out with a website. They have pitched already two programs. Tigeras and Goldman already lined up for the some of the banks. So once again, thank you all of you. Greetings from Foundation. Thank you. I stop here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your inspiring words. As always, we will continue to be guided and motivated by you. Now we move ahead. I request Srimati Usha Torat, Madam, to deliver her presidential address. She served as a deputy governor between 2005 and 2010. Actually, the unlock and ease of doing business may be buzzwords in the modern day dictionary of India. But she has been doing it for the last 30 years. The last one be the regulator recognizing the market that existed outside the shores of the country. Madam, over to you for your presidential address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyagrajan. Good afternoon to everyone. Nice to see you here, uh, Krishnamurti, after a long time. And uh, seeing all the others, Mr. Sambamurti, it's a great idea and initiative you've started. It's good to see friends like Padmanabhan and Mahalingam, as always, and all the other colleagues who are present here. Really happy to be present at this inauguration of a learning intervention, let me call it a learning intervention, by a group of former Syndicate Bank uh, Forex dealers and experts who have, since leaving Syndicate Bank long ago, risen to very senior positions in industry banking and finance. 
and they now feel the need to give back and to develop capacities in a whole new generation of market participants and i think that is a really tremendous initiative i know mr murthy's uh, dynamism and his penchant for reading and studying and also applying the best lessons to the functioning of any organization he has been connected with so the team finding founding this particular foundation is very impressive and their goals are both to educate develop skills and also to explore and debate on how financial markets can really help develop the economy i think that we should never forget the link between the financial markets and the real economy so just to i mean i i think i cannot but help look look at the you know the kind of what, where the markets are today and the outstanding thing that we find as far as the rupee is concerned and i'm quoting the bis triennial survey released in september 2019 which showed that indian rupee accounted for 1.7% of the global forex turnover in 2019 compared to 1.1% in 2016 clearly shows the rise of the rupee in the global markets the daily average volume of rupee trading in india was 35 billion and in contrast the daily average trading volume of the rupee in uk was 46.82 and 14.40 billion in us and 12.57 in hong kong so the us dollar indian rupee non deliverable forwards volumes increased 3x between 2016 and 2019 accounting for 82% of the total outright forwards in us dinr in 2019 as compared to 74.3% in 2016 now this is something i think you should take as a real challenge the real challenge is how do we bring this rupee markets on shore i think the issue is no doubt closely connected with issues of capital the kind of regulations we have capital account control controls and implications for financial stability even so i do believe that the infrastructure can be created and regulations can be rationalized for making it much easier for non residents to hedge their underlying positions in india in the onshore markets without compromising on the existing capital controls this was the thrust of the measures recommended last year by the task force where i had the privilege to chair mahalingam and sajid were members and they are both here we had the benefit of significant inputs from padmanabhan shamla anant narayanan and i do hope that these recommendations can are implemented so that the onshore markets will grow to the fullest potential when i look at the forex markets today my mind goes back to the 80s when i was posted in rbi chennai i had my first brush with the forex markets and the dealing rooms of state bank of hyderabad and indian overseas bank both these banks had very competent dealers even though there was a fixed exchange rate and tyagrajan and shriram and others will remember uh there was a ban between the buying rate and the selling rate and the permission to have open daylight positions and a limited overnight position and have certain gap limits did offer the traders in our markets to actually develop their skills and they were also allowed to do cross currency trades between banks in india and the justification for that that was effectively a zero sum game for the indian market it gave good scope for developing skills in the indian market there were stalwarts like subramaniam and kulkarni who were in reserve bank they were born teachers and they challenged and mentored the youngsters in the reserve bank there were many mentors in the foreign exchange markets who generously gave of their skills to anyone who sought them names that come to mind are nerlekar narsimha rao amresh chandramouli ganesh rao from state bank of hyderabad Syndicate Bank. I remember Bala, who continue, later was, of course, the most frequent to, uh, lecturer in the Bankers Training College. Chitra Gola from City. Some of you may remember, who started the boards in BTC. And the 80s also saw a couple of scams in the forex market. Shaker of Bank of India, who concealed positions. Rakesh Saxena of OBC, who got into multiple trading transactions through pseudo swap transactions. These cases. taught the reserve bank a lot about internal control in dealing rooms and the icg the internal control by guidelines was definitely our bible one great learning in this era was also how capital controls could be easily 
bypassed, arbitraged. I don't know whether Padmanabhan remembers, but I can't forget the ADGP 15 of 1985. It's a still, I recall, it prohibited banks guaranteeing forex borrowings under import letters of credit that could be used to take advantage of interest differentials. Lean marked FCNRA funds was another huge source of borrowers' funds to get the interest rate difference. So it's not surprising later that 35 years later, we have many, many more ways in which all these arbitrages can happen. The period after 1991 was clearly uncharted territory for RBI. But the smooth switchover from a fixed exchange rate system to a market determined one would not have been possible were it not for the team of these dealers. From the various banks like Syndicate Bank, Spike Bank of Hyderabad, IOB, Canada Bank, many of the foreign banks who were actively trading within the RBI buying rate and selling rate and even took positions in the forward markets. The transition to LERMS when 40% of the volumes were traded at the fixed exchange, exchange rate and the balance at the market rate, it was literally a dual exchange rate system. I don't think people acknowledge that this could not have happened so smoothly without the existence of well-equipped dealing rooms and competent dealers. The unified exchange rate system put in place in 1993 was a bold step. Governor Rangarajan came with the deputy governor, Mr. Janki Raman, to the dealing room, I was there in that DIO, before 9 a.m. on that day. All of us were terribly tense to see where would the first code come and at what spread. There was a relief as the spreads started off with something like 1 rupee or 2 rupees, I don't recollect. It quickly settled down to about 25 paise. Various events are etched in my memory. After that, there was this 1995 uh, Tumel to us when dollar DM touched that all time low and the rupee plummeted to 36 rupees from 3170 where it had been for such a long time. Intervention by itself failed to act and tough monetary measures had to be used in 1996 to ensure currency stability. The events later on in, 2000, in 1997 triggered by the famous Ready speech culminated in 1998 when call rates rose to over 100%. Bimal Jalan, I remember a variety of measures, sledgehammer, administrative, forex, monetary, the daily newspaper headlines were only about the rupee. In more recent period, we have seen the 2008 crisis, the taper tantrums 2013, and of course, the more recent events, which clearly show that forex markets are much more integrated. The studies by the task force showed that the price linkages between the offshore markets and the onshore markets are found to be bi-directional, both in terms of their averages and their volatility. They have a strong long-term relationship and when a shock throws that relationship into a disequilibrium, both the onshore spot and forward and offshore rates converge towards each other. During stress episodes, the NDF markets seems to have a unidirectional approach on the onshore markets, but the markets converge soon thereafter and this is repeatedly seen even in the recent period. And when the rupee is strengthening, the onshore drives the offshore markets. So managing interest rate risk and forest risk, risk by market participants requires the development of deep and liquid markets, deep and liquid derivatives markets, which can be used to manage risk. Now, the development of this market is constrained. Some say by the lack of the so-called BCD nexus, which would obviously call for removal of capital controls, but also because of players, especially in the public sector banks, reluctant to get into these derivative markets. Partly due to lack of skills, but mostly due to the hangover of the court cases in which some of them are still involved. That, that said, there is no doubt that initiative of this kind will help the markets develop. And the day is not far off when we can say that most of the foreign, rupee forex trades will be done in India and not offshore. But I am giving you a role a little beyond the forex as well. Today, as we are in the global world, the financial markets are being used for a variety of public purposes. You've heard about the green bond, you've heard about climate bonds, you've heard about philanthropy bonds, impact development bonds. There are a whole lot of marketization of products to be able to uh, mobilize funds for financial, economic, impact investing and even philanthropy. So I think this group of people and when they are mentoring the youngsters should be encouraging the development constantly of new products 
which can really help make this world a better place with those words i thank you for inviting me and thank you for you know requesting me to be available and preside over this function thank you very much absolutely our pleasure man actually you gave us a summary of what happened in the 80s and 90s actually possibly you took us back three decades back anyway it has been an inspirational speech and possibly it gives us more impetus to be mentoring the new generation now the moment has arrived we request dr krishnan <coughs> subramanyam to inaugurate the syfx treasury foundation and to deliver his inaugural address dr krishnan subramanyam the chief economic advisor to government of india he is a phd from chicago booth and a leading expert on economic policy banking and corporate governance by integrating india's spiritual heritage with modern economic ideas he advocates ethical wealth creation his idea of polynomics possibly has been acclaimed as the indian big bang index we request dr krishnamurthy subramanyam to inaugurate the foundation and share his thoughts in his inaugural address sir over to you very good afternoon uh, eminent dignitaries and many of them faces that i had looked up to as a youngster among them certainly madam thorat uh, samamurthy sir uh, i'm really humbled to be amongst all of you to be here for a very important occasion let me first congratulate all of you for i think this excellent initiative on this is as madam thorat very rightly said it is it is a teaching initiative mentoring initiative i think which is which is very important once i had the opportunity to mention to one of my mentors uh, dr raghuram rajan that the only way in which we get to repay the debt that we you know have to our mentors is by paying it forward that we what, what we get as mentoring we actually give far more than that it's very similar to in some sense you know parenting we economists think about you know the economy often times in overlapping generation models where you know the, the the parents generation actually overlaps with the kids generation the only way you know we get to repay our debt uh, it said in uh, vedanta that no one ever gets to repay his or her debt to his parents the only way we get to do that is by actually you know paying it forward to our kids so in that sense and I, and in that spirit i think this is a very very important initiative apart from the fact that uh, the the request came from somebody whom i enormously respect uh, samumurthy sir the fact that this is such an important initiative uh, led me to have absolutely no hesitation in immediately agreeing to to be here i am indeed very privileged to be here i would like to you know given the momentous occasion i would like to recall my own some of the examples of how i have benefited so much from from mentors and and why i therefore think this is such an important initiative i will also try and give my perspective on you know what i think are the areas where this foundation can really uh, contribute in terms of you know knowledge creation but i think it's appropriate at this occasion for me to recall some of the you know some of the some of the key mentors uh, many times when i now mention to them they actually brush it off as saying oh i didn't do much but it's only the mentee that knows actually how much the mentor contributed for the mentor it's basically just another another mentee so one of the mentors that i really value is uh, in dr nachiket mor when i joined my first job after my i am Cal- uh, you know finishing my am calcutta uh, education was uh, icic and i joined the derivatives research group and i have absolutely no hesitation in saying that when i joined you know at that time many of us looked up to dr more saying we wanted to be like him we wanted to be as erudite as him we wanted to be as articulate as him we wanted to be as visionary as him in fact the derivatives research group itself was started by him you know to really get the uh, best talent from the you know from the management institutions engineer mbas who could work at that time you know on derivatives for instance some of the work that i did there actually we were pricing options that icici used to issue there were these put and call options on icici securities we would price those options the market used to 
if it was a seven year bond with a five year put and call option typically the market would price it as a five year instrument and we used to price it as actually a bond with an embedded option in it um, and that required then building you know models like the hijaro morton model for fixed pricing fixed income securities and that's the kind of you know vision that he had at that point in time i'll i'll recall a particular instance which is very fond in my memory so he wrote my letters when i was applying for my phd program and also got me in touch when i was deciding between two schools that i had to go to that i had gotten in nyu stern and and chicago booth he put me in touch with dr rajan and i was able to you know because they were batchmates from from i am ahmedabad uh, i that that conversation with dr rajan before joining the phd uh, helped me crystallize my mind as to which school to choose to so these are all small small things but make a big difference in one's life at that time i you know i very very fond instance i remember is uh, so b- when i was applying i did not know much about university of chicago i'll be very honest um, and uh, one as an engineer one had heard about stanford and at that time you know both chicago and stanford when the business schools were known as graduate schools of business gsp so um, when i got this email at that time uh, dr dr nachiket mor was interviewing you know two year juniors of ours at i am ahmedabad they had gone to interview so i got this email read it it was from it said from gsb graduate school of business so i, I opened it with a lot of excitement thinking that i had gotten an admit from stanford and then i opened and read it and and said chicago gsb i was actually disappointed um, thing it's not from stanford so i I, I called up Dr. Moore and said that uh, you know I I've gotten this admission from uh, you know from Chicago University of Chicago. I thought it would be from Stanford. I, it is not from Stanford. And I still remember he actually you know was in the midst of an interview, walked out of the interview, and said, uh, "Subhu, you must actually be very, you know acknowledge that uh, for economics, University of Chicago is actually rated far far higher than Stanford as well." so you know it it's that kind of personal connection and that um, personal rap or personal care for for a mentee that i think one one really recalls back um, uh, a second mentor whom i of course remain in, in you know incredibly indebted to is uh, dr ragram rajan um, i i recall this this instance when um, you know when i was a phd student second year to phd student writing my first pa- first research paper and uh, set up, i had set up a meeting to go and uh, discuss the paper and i actually have uh, again uh, you know with a lot of admiration it was about a one and a half two hour meeting he said after hearing the first few minutes of the paper he said let's go to the board we went to the classroom this was this was summer times actually summer so there were no classes that were being held you know went into the analytical model you know went on the board and i must admit that at the end of one and a half of hours you know i ended up understanding my own work far far better than than i actually uh, than i than i did and one of the qualities that actually stands out with him which i have noticed and i'll mention is his is ability to listen never interrupts in you know in between you know when he's saying something when i i'm saying he will listen carefully not interrupt at all and that is something which i've seen is such an important ability in you know in um, in a senior management uh, personnel and i think the only other person whom i have seen who's a better listener than dr rajan is the honorable prime minister um I- I- even in you know and and i have now been fortunate enough to have you know one on one sessions where um he's listened so carefully and if you're saying something important his eyes eyes will dilate you know and uh, you can see he's actually all of a sudden paying even more attention but never interrupts in between and I, i think that is something which i have actually come to admire as a very important quality in in a in a, in, in anybody who's in senior management that you know because decision making is about taking all all inputs and being humble enough to say that i don't know at all and and therefore the only way in which we can actually get all that learning is to be like an open you know like an open bucket uh, incidentally ramana maharishi used to say in the in the context of being you know um, sort of open for for new things to come in he used to say if you go to an ocean with a uh with you know in, in tamil it's called kungumachimeya which is actually like a spoon size 
If you go to an ocean with a, 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 a spoon, then you will only get out so much water. But if you go to an ocean with a very big bucket, you will get that much of water. Um, I think this is another aspect that, um, that you know, as part of the, uh, the syndicate uh, uh, bank foreign, you know, uh, the foundation, treasury foundations, you must definitely inculcate among those who want to learn that it's very important to go with an open mind. You know, among people like you, there is an ocean of knowledge. But if one does not go in with that humility to say that there is a lot of learning, if I know, if, if, they, if the mentees come in with the idea that I know it all, I don't think they will be able to gain as much from the experience that you all have and the knowledge that you have all. And so apart from, the, uh, from, from knowledge itself, I think the process of learning, what is what we think about as, you know, learning about learning itself is also a very important aspect that you must emphasize on. Um, I see this many times, you know, in my own, uh, you know, with my own experience as a teacher, that unlearning is oftentimes a very important proce process of learning as well. Uh, because many conceptions that we may have had, you know, uh, given our experiences may create blinkers and unlearning is important. And therefore, it's important for mentees to come, you know, to a, a source like yours, an ocean of knowledge, with with a big patram, you know, with a with a big bigger con big container, open mind, which is basically open, not with a small spoon. I think um, that that's incredibly important. A, a third example I will I will mention, you know, uh, not I didn't have the fortune to get mentored by him, but uh, when Sambhamurti sir was mentioning about um, about you know about retirement and saying that you know not waiting to die, I'm reminded of of this instance, and I I still recall. Um, so my, the very first class that I attended at the University of Chicago was taught by Professor Gary Becker. Um, Professor Gary Becker is the uh, 1992 Nobel Laureate in Economics. And uh, literally, I must, you know, I, and again, I will um, acknowledge my being like a kid in a candy shop at that time, you know, literally pinched myself to, for, the, for the first class to be taught by a Nobel Laureate. Uh, but what stood out really was that you know, he was in his mid 80s at that time, 85. Um, and he used to come to class, teach the class. And there used to be a chair that used to be kept for him because he would go on the board, write, write stuff and then sit and lecture because he couldn't stand the entire entire period. But one of the things that he used to he used to say, I think I it's just sort of um, it, it just stayed with my in my consci conscience, which is he used to say that, you know, uh, I want to give out all that is here. I want to give it to the to the next generation. And, you know, in his mid 80s as well, that spirit, that spirit of a scholar, you know, I think it, it just just endears you to to such such individuals um, because it's it's those ideals that make you you know want to pursue such 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 ideals i think this initiative actually has that spirit in it and and therefore i am i'm very very happy to be to be part of uh, part of part of this initiative to actually you know uh, have the privilege of of inaugurating it as it is said in the bhagavad gita uh, chapter 3 shloka 21 Yad yad acharati sreshtataha tat tad eve terojanaha sayat pramanam kurute lokas tad anuvartade yad yad acharati sreshtataha sreshth there is no doubt that all of you have knowledge that you all will bring sre you are sreshth you are basically special yad yad acharati sreshtataha acharan your behavior yad yad acharati sreshtataha tat tad eve terojanaha that's how janaha people who basically whom you will teach those who will look up to you will follow. Sayat Pramanam Kurute. Not just talk, but the proof of behavior. The way we actually behave, people like you behave. Sayat Pramanam Kurute Lokastad Anuvartate. I don't think there can be a better spirit of the mentor mentee relationship, you know, than than this beautiful shloka from the from the Bhagavad Gita. And I think uh, in 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 living some of these, some of these uh, you know, timeless principles um, of sharing knowledge of actually giving it all you know um, i think this is a this is a really laudable initiative that I, uh, I that i sincerely hope and pray to the almighty that it has enormous impact on the you know on on the markets financial markets and thereby on the economy as well now from the, that possible you know some metaphysical ideas let me come down a few you know a uh, few notches and talk about some tangible 
uh, you know areas that I think would be very important for the you know for the for this initiative to really focus on. One is of course on forex market itself, but I want to talk about something something which is far more far more important, um, and you know especially for instance the. Uh, the law on netting that we've brought now that has been passed by parliament um, you know as as you all would know that actually has the real scope for enabling derivatives and you know madam thorat i'm sure certainly appreciates samamurthy sir all of you will appreciate but i want to make a larger point and i this is something which i have seen um, from a youngster now to actually a middle aged man that i often times see a lot of dread of derivatives in the indian economy in the policy making space as well and um, especially the global financial crisis the interpretation of that has been a lot of people have interpreted it to say that look this is why we should not be doing derivatives uh, and here the uh, humble request i have to the uh, large group of experienced professionals that are that are assembled is to try and you know clarify to the youngsters that it's not the instrument per se that actually is wrong it's the way in which that instrument gets misused and which then goes back to governance that is where actually the problem is um, i i think to say that the that the derivatives is um, is is wrong often times and i will actually be very blunt and say some I mean, it's a complicated area it's an area that requires a lot of effort to understand um what what youngsters should not be doing and market participants should not be doing is to actually you know uh, use this as as an alibi to to not understand something which is actually involved and therefore requires effort to understand it should not be an alibi for laziness uh, of of intellect um i think that is that is incredibly important um but i want to make a a, a broader point and this is in terms of the way we think about regulation uh, itself um so let me let me use a parallel if i have to cook food i have to go and light a fire because i cannot cook cook food without ever lighting a fire now when i light the fire there will be times when i might burn my hand that's the that's the nature of the fire that if you're not careful it it will burn but if i am actually scared so scared so mortally scared that you know the fire will burn me and therefore i do not light the fire at all then i have to go hungry i have to die hungry i think this point is is you know something that people in forex markets i'm sure certainly understand the concept of risk and return um uh, when we look at sometimes the way we think about in terms of the policy making space we tend to be very very conservative because of this of this idea that oh if i actually you know if i don't light the fire at all then there is no way of of me you know uh, getting burnt you know even if that means i basically i or maybe the country has to go hungry so be it in the process i think that is that is the incorrect way of thinking about these 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 instruments um it's it's a very important idea that that you know we have to actually take these into account because even the global financial crisis no when one reads the literature you know i've had my the opportunity to contribute to this literature as well if we go back and look at the 20 25 year phenomenon that culminated in the crisis in the united states the securitization that happened that led to home ownership of a unprecedented scale and its securitization you know with, together with the presence of agencies like fanny mae and freddy mac um, the the subprime all that really enabled you know home ownership of an unprecedented state it started with uh, with bill clinton coming in who actually made this as you know as his as his uh, point of emphasis so yes the 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 united states actually you know did have this period of the global financial crisis but to to look at the financial crisis in isolation with the, the cost that it created without looking at the benefits that came with it is i think is a very partial interpretation and if i'm if i'm pushed i would also say a very vested interpretation for for people who basically do not want to let you know some of these areas of of markets open up um, and i think that is something that must be avoided uh, let me give you one more parallel it's as if 
you know if i eat too much it, you know often times economic systems are also like the human body if i eat too much you no know, i have to actually i become obese i may have to go on a on a diet for some time and that's what a crisis is um, but the fact that you know if you only look at the period when i go into dieting but ignore the 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 fun that i had eating all that time i think that's a very partial way of looking at it so this is very important this perspective that the global financial crisis actually yes it had its cost but it actually created enormous benefits as well is a very important perspective that that you know knowledgeable people like you have to really impart to the to the youngsters lest india is deprived of some of the benefits of risk sharing what is finally a derivative or a securitization transaction it enables actually optimal risk sharing and that is something that has to be enabled our youngsters have to go and you know get out of their of the of the of laziness of intellect and go and invest in understanding these uh, and and you know policy makers as well so that we actually do light the fire manage the fire and thereby actually cook enough to have for 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 everyone i think this is incredibly important this is so that's one of the key um, ideas that, that i thought i would actually lay out for for you a second but very related uh, aspect is is about the banking sector i think you know many of you would have seen the the chapter on in the economic survey uh, the, the this year's uh, january 2009 2000 a 20 economic survey on 50 years of on the golden jubilee of bank nationalization let me state out a few facts that's my nature i actually will say it the way i see it if you look at the top 100 banks globally and look at the number of banks that we have indian banks that we have in the global top 100 we have one bank in the global top 100 and that is a 55th ranked state bank of india for a country that is fifth in the in terms of the size of its economy ranks fifth india does not even rank among the top 20 leave to opt empty lop you know not even in the in the um, top 20 in terms of the number of banks in the global top 100 if we had the number of banks that is commensurate to the size of its economy we should have had six six banks in the global top 100 if you look at the penetration of credit among you know oecd economies and compare that to india private credit to gdp in india is about 52 53% the oecd average is 160% 52% 160% are one third of of what the oecd average is the fifth largest economy and um, uh, thorat madam absolutely right rightly said that the financial sector has to be seen in the context of growth and we have such low credit penetration you know i can keep talking about my frustrations with the banking sector but i will just summarize it in one uh, another parallel using cricket all of us you know in the, with the 1990s cricket team i you know a time when i used to be far more passionate about cricket the 1990s cricket team was known for actually you know winning on 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 you know tailor made pitches in india but had nothing noteworthy to actually show when it stepped out of the indian shores the indian banking sector today is exactly the same way lot of possibly things to crow about you know when you look in the indian context but globally nothing really to note to, to noteworthy to write about except possibly the financial inclusion uh, program you know that has been done in the you know um, the 40 40 crore financial accounts um, and this i speak based on global statistics um, and you know um, i see tyagarajan sir actually shaking his head you know um, may not he may not agree with me but that's fine but you know i would i would still lay out that even if let's say you know some of you of you do not agree with this stark picture that i present i think the fact that we have a long way to go in the banking sector to make it globally of a global scale i think is something that i would want to want you all to consider even if you do not agree with and you know um, and, and this is related to to something that you know samamuthi sir himself is actually so passionate about and really good with is is technology if we look at and this is something that we went into in great detail even if you look at our private sector banks as well even the private sector banks use data analytics technology etc only for retail lending 
corporate lending which is something where you know not only the ability to repay but the willingness to repay models can be used to actually ascertain both of those you know the use of that whether by public sector banks or by private sector banks has been minimal and you know for instance in the survey we showed that just simple indicators like the quality of the financial statement among the 30 dozen that we all know about the 30 dozen or for instance the use of related party transactions the extent of promoter share that is pledged um, and therefore what is the skin in the game of the promoter simple indicators like these are you know very good predictors of the of the willingness to repay something that could have easily been done and yet was not done and that is why we had we've had this problem of accelerator and break where we actually when the economy accelerates you know all the banks especially public sector banks each public sector bank goes into you know into difficult it goes gives credit but when the economy knows dies every public sector bank in effectively ends up ends up going into trouble and and that's where this is the systematic problem we have versus the idiosyncratic problem of yes because i hear this often time saying oh, what about the private sector banks yes bank has had a problem as well but we have to make a distinction between idiosyncratic and systematic problems i think something that again i would hope that all of you will will basically as statesmen not necessarily just as public sector bankers but as statesmen that you are today will look at it actually and say that these are the problems that need to be need to be really really addressed so that the banking sector can punch you know according to the weight of of the of the, of the economy and thereby contribute to the uh, to, to the goal of india becoming the third largest economy uh, as a 5 trillion dollar uh, uh, economy thank you very much once again let me congratulate all the people who have taken this initiative it's a very very laudable initiative something that you know really in some sense the the guru shishya parampara that india is known for um, i think establishing that the spirit behind this initiative uh, i wish the foundation all good luck and you know my my very best wishes so that some of the important problems that the country is grappling with can actually be addressed by the contribution of this foundation thank you very much thanks dr keshavmurthy subramanyam we are actually indeed proud to have been inaugurated by you and more than that the inaugural speech i think possibly the takeaways are so many the only one thing that stood out learning about learning actually possibly i think we continue to learn as simple as this thank you so much for your the inaugural speech possibly it inspires us much more than what we intended for now we move ahead mr g mahalingam the next speaker he is the currently world time member sebi prior to this assignment mr mahalingam held the position of executive director in rbi as a executive director he was in charge of both money markets as well as the forex markets he has been always associated with all the educational activities in the financial markets for the last 30 years so it is our privilege to get our website syfx.org inaugurated by him request mr mahalingam to share his thoughts and launch our website dr krishnamurthy subramanyam chief economic advisor of the country mr padmanabhan vikram limay mr tyagraj in again and mr anand narayanan the panel members here i am extremely happy to be here i think it's a kind of a momentous occasion clearly coming from the ex syndicate bankers for this admirable educational initiative i think clearly everything flows from the leadership of mr sambhomurthy sir followed by all the steam members headed by tyagarajan i know treasury managing treasury has always been a great and a challenging and an interesting experience for several reasons one is of course it's a profit center and number two one has to be quick witted out there and he has to have a very swift decision making skills we ourselves from the reserve bank of india in fact the all three of us sitting here madam thorad mr padmanabhan and myself we are from the rbi treasury and we have worked in the rbi treasury for quite some time dr subramanyam talked about mentors and i am very happy to say that my mentor is here madam thorad i have worked with her for a very long time starting from the reserve bank's officers training college on to the department which manages the foreign exchange reserves 
and subsequently. The point that I am trying to say is, Treasury has always been a learning experience. Not even a single day passes in the Treasury without your encountering a new experience, a new point, a new learning experience. The financial markets are always very vibrant. They come up with imponderables. They come up with various problems. And in RBI particularly, I mean, I'm trying to compare a commercial bank or a financial institution's treasury with RBI. In RBI, I think every crisis becomes a newer and a newer learning experience. We always come up with a variety of measures to cope with the crisis. And the reforms that, is, that are put in, maybe the post-crisis measures, they are again a new chapter which opens up every time. This is especially interesting because it becomes a kind of a trade-off. It's a trade-off between a kind of an unfettered market liberalization that one we can contemplate at one end of the spectrum vis-a-vis -vis the financial stability that's going to be affected if the market is going to be liberalized, I mean, endlessly. So this is where I think this striking a right balance has been a tremendous challenge it's a tremendous interesting, it's a tremendously interesting experience which keeps all of us engrossed in this entire exercise. In fact, I would say the entire community of bankers here, whether it is the foreign bankers or the private sector banks or the public sector banks, they have risen to the occasion and we have had extensive dialogues with this entire set of bankers to roll out any reform measures, to roll out any crisis management measures. And that has made this entire Treasury experience pretty, pretty interesting. And I'm sure, given this background of experience, that a wealth of experience that all you syndicate bank Treasury people have, I'm sure you are going to give out a lot more to the community than what you derive from the community. And that's going to be a fantastic exercise. I'm going to leave with just three questions because you are a foundation. So you can really apply your mind and put your, put your thinking hats on. One, the corporate bond market. I think the country needs a vibrant bond market. We have been talking about this for a long time. But I'm going to leave with this question. There's a lot of work that is being done by the regulators now. SEBI is doing a lot of work along with the government, along with the Reserve Bank of India. We are trying to work on how to build a set of market makers here how to address the liquidity risk in the problem, can we set up a, buy, a kind of a backstop facility which would come and buy the bonds at the time the liquidity sets in? Can we try to activate a tripartite repo system on the lines of the CBLO, which is operated by the CCIL, with a band of market makers, and who can get regular funding in a manner to hold this inventory of securities. Now, this is an open question. This we are working on, and we are at it with a lot more, I mean, thought process being borrowed from several people. Let's see how things are going to work out. The second thing that I would like to touch on is IFSE, which Mr. Krishnamurti Subramanian also talked about, which Madam Thoret also alluded to. I think this is a very important idea which does not brook any failure at all. I think all of us as stakeholders in the market, we need to work together. We need to cast aside the regulatory uh, jurisdictions, come out of the jurisdictions, I think cooperate with each other and make this IFSC successful. Now, I am not talking about something that whether this market is going to cannibalize the domestic market and all that, I am not really concerned about it. I am concerned about whether IFSC can be brought about as a competitor to Singapore, as a competitor to Dubai, as a competitor to New York, as a competitor to London in the next about five years' time. I think with the kind of talent pool that we have within the country, if we wish we could do that, I think what perhaps cannot make it happen is a kind of bureaucratic setup which brings a lot of ego in which brings a lot of artificial barriers in. We need to really 
unshackle those barriers and try to live up, uh, bring up this market. The third is the currency futures market in India. I think this is just a small idea that I'm going to leave with the foundation which they can think about. I think if all of us go back in 2008 when the currency futures markets were introduced in the country, it was exclusively introduced for the small and medium enterprises who found the banker's cost really very formidable to deal with in the foreign exchange as with the bankers. So that's how the currency futures market came in. But today, unfortunately, the currency futures market is a non-deliverable market. You don't get the dollars here. You actually net off and get the net payment out here. Can we make it happen that the small and medium enterprises which go and buy or sell dollars here, can we make it deliverable? I'm leaving again an open question. This is something which can be worked on, which is just not impossible at all. Now, if this could be done, the small and medium enterprises can go back home with dollars, can offload their dollars, at a nominal cost. I'm thankful to the foundation for giving me an opportunity to speak here. I'm very happy that the website is getting inaugurated by me. I'm very sure this website is going to become the guidepost for the, all the future treasury guys. Thank you very much, Tyagarajan. Thank you very much, Sambo Murthy, sir. Thank you. Sir, all your suggestions well taken and I think we will come back to you on the suggestions within a short span of time. Now, actually Indian markets have a daddy. Of course, all of us who are there in the forex markets know who is the daddy is. But Indian markets do have a paddy. That is Mr. Padmanabhan, the former executive director of Reserve Bank of India, an authority on FX and authority on payment systems. Sir, over to you for sharing your thoughts and then uh, releasing our digital souvenir, a compendium of essays written by the economists and students on the contemporary issues. Over to you, Mr. Padmanabh. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thank you for inviting me to this function and also entrusting me with the pleasant job of e-releasing the digital souvenir. I consider myself quite appropriate for that because I was a student of economics maybe 30 years ago. After that, I've been a banker. One problem with going last in an audience like this, particularly we have the common mentor and uh, me and Mahalingam almost went through the same kind of experience within the Reserve Bank of India, dealt with the same areas, is that just as they say that everyone coming out of the Chicago book is an inflation talk. Probably all of us have the same idea, so we wouldn't know what is the new thing that I should be presenting after Mrs. Thorat and Mr. Malingam have spoken. Let me try. I think as I sit before you, I feel a bit like a hero in the Rip Van Winkle story, and but with a twist. Everyone is familiar. All our friends, unlike in the story when Rip Van Winkle woke up, he found that nobody he knew. But in a way, Everything is different because of the COVID. This is a new place, a new world we are not used to. No rules, I would again reiterate, have been made for such a situation by anyone. It is trial and error. It is months since we physically met in a group, but we are busy almost every day talking to hundreds of people. So, to lighten the get together. An old photo shared some remark of the how young look. Now the regulator in me had to intervene and I corrected saying that we did not look young, we were young at that point of time. Today we may not look young, but we are still young. It applies, I think, as Sambamurti said, the best years are still ahead of us, and it applies to most of us here. And let me assure you that as long as we keep ourselves busy and keep interacting, particularly with the young crowd, we shall continue to be young. So this is a tremendous uh, uh, initiative that has been started by the ex syndicate Bank Treasury team. Now, the second is a little more interesting because after seeing me often in webinars, one of my well-wishers recently sent me an advice which said that in normal times, if anyone keeps talking to the air or a screen, thinking that there are hundreds of people listening, 
it used to be called as delusion. But in COVID times, it's called the webinar. So I'm very happy to be a part of this brave new world and this webinar. We used to recognize in Reserve Bank of India that there are two big suppliers of forex dealers to the forex market. And one obviously was the big daddy. And the second was Syndicate Bank. I think the number of people who left Syndicate Bank, who were groomed by Syndicate Bank, who became treasury uh, heads or part of treasury team in other banks and large corporates have been enormous. I think I've been fortunate to meet and interact with many of them from Syndicate Bank. And most of them, I presume, have logged in today. Many in this group, be it Bala, who must have logged in from London, or Venkat or Tiagu, we are all a part of the team from whom I must admit that I learned the nuances of the forex market and its complexities and on whom I personally, I think Malingam would vouch for this, most of us dependent when we are trying to make certain policy changes, as it is said that policy making is often an attempted grave. We do not know what is going to be the outcome. So we wanted advice which was given which was not with reference to your own balance sheet, but with looking at the macro issues as a whole. I think these are the guys we depend upon enormously in Reserve Bank while making policies. I think we could achieve a lot looking at how the Indian markets have developed over the years, but still one feels it is just the beginning. And that is the excitement and enthusiasm that this market brings. Now, people may think that I've talked a lot, but have I forgotten the hero? No, my first interaction with the Pitamaha of this venture Samba Murthy was in London. I don't know whether he recalls several years ago. It was destined that our paths shall cross several times and we have kept up our friendship both professionally and personally. He's an academic lovingly called the professor and it is no surprise to me that a venture of this nature aimed at giving back to the society the knowledge syndicate bank treasury experts, uh, experts have gathered enormously over years i think he flagged something like thousand uh, number which is enormous has blossomed over uh, under his stewardships now one thing that you must realize that foreign exchange market always appears esoteric from outside and the rate calculation based on which the common man undertakes small value forex transaction is a mystery to many and not to mention the complaints of you due to lack of transparency. Please remember that the non-banks and the technology invades those areas where the banks are not reasonable or transparent. So this is an area which I would suggest that the team should look into, please ensure that we are able to make the users of Forex market understand about these rates and the intricacies of rate calculation and how best we can have a transparent system as far as this particular aspect is concerned. Please understand one thing, in today's world, it is not, it is not knowledge that is power because the the all-powerful knowledge is the Google itself, but it's a knowledge sharing which is power and that becomes very critical in what we are endeavoring to do and, and I'm extremely excited about it. I think the two critical areas, the others are already flagged. Let me reiterate that. I think the way in which we are able to bring up the International Financial Center of the Gibbs City is extremely important for a different reason. India could afford itself a number of years to develop the forex market, which has happened over a period of two, two and a half, three decades. But that kind of luxury is not available to develop an international financial center when you are already starting running. Or you are, you are already, you are competing with the rest of the world, which has already developed. So how quickly we are able to get this up is a challenge for you. The second thing is I, I, uh, recall a movie which I saw long ago, a, a very complicated uh, story where finally it's a murder story where the murderer is found. At the end of it, they say that to the hero that you have found the murderer here, but there is this guy, whatever be his name, who built the LIC some hundred years ago. Can you find out where he is? Now, where I'm leading, most of you would have understood. When we entered Reserve Bank, 
the missing market was the corporate debt market. What we tried to develop in Reserve Bank was the corporate debt market. It is at least five years since I left Reserve Bank of India, the missing market is still the corporate debt market. As Mr. Malingan flagged, this becomes extremely critical as we take this country to greater heights. So what we can do from our side to make sure that this market develops, I would think that is a critical challenge that you can look at. Happy to be a part of your endeavors wherever you need me. And I'm extremely happy to release the key souvenir. All the very best. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chagarajan, before I conclude, there are two messages I just want to share with the audience. Dr. Reddy was delighted when I informed him that we are going to have this foundation. He sent his greetings and best wishes. He is very keen the foundation should succeed. Dr. Vaivi Reddy. And then one of the co founder yeah. of our Forex division, Mr. K. Lakshmanarayan. He is two years short of 90, right? He still drives his car and all that. And I shared with him, he was extremely delighted and he wished the foundation all success. Yes, I wanted to share. Thanks, sir. Now we move over to the second segment of the evening, that is the panel discussion. I request Mr. Vigadeshan to introduce the panelists and moderator. Over to Vigadeshan. Uh, thanks, Jagum. The first panelist, uh, Mr. Sajid Chinai. Sajid Chinai is uh, JP Morgan's chief India economist and a member of Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He served as a member of RBI's Export Committee to revise and strengthen the monetary policy framework that uh, posed inflation targeting in India. He was a consultant to the FRBM Review Committee set up by the government to propose a new fiscal anchor and a member of the Indian Bank Association Monetary Policy Group. He had worked at IMF in Washington, D.C. and was a senior associate at McKinsey and Company in New York. Welcome, Sajid. Next, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Adarshina. Adarshina is Managing Director and Co-Head of Asia Rates and Currency Strategy at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. He is known for his billion currency calls and is hailed as one of the best in the region. Before joining Bank of America, Merrill Lynch Strategy in uh, August 2010, Sina worked as a Senior Currency Strategist at Barclays Capital, responsible for covering G10 countries with a focus on Europe. He holds a master's degree in economics from uh, England's uh, University of Oxford and University of Warwick. Welcome, Adarsh. Thank you. Mr. Samir Goel. Mr. Samir Goel is uh, Managing Director, Head of uh, Asia Macro Strategy at Deutsche Bank, based in Singapore. He joined Deutsche Bank in 2005 and has 15 years of experience in coverage of fixed income and uh, currency markets in non Japan Asia. Prior to joining Deutsche Bank, Mr. Goel worked as the regional currency and rate strategist for Bank of America in Singapore. An economist by training, Mr. Goel has an MSc degree from London School of Economics and uh, Political Science and an MA from University of Cambridge. Welcome, Samir. Next, Mr. Pranjul Bandari. Mr. Pranjul Bandari joined uh, HSBC in November 2014 as a chief economist for India. Prior to this, uh, she uh, completed a resident fellowship at the IMF after graduating as a Mason Fellow from uh, Harvard Kennedy School. 2019, Pranjil became a member of RBI's Committee on Developing India's Housing Finance Market. 2020, she was a part of the Forbes magazine list of 20 self-made women. Pranjil holds a Master's in Economics from University of Cambridge, UK, and a BA in Economics from uh, St. Stephen's College, Delhi. Welcome, Pranjul. Our moderator, Mr. Anant Narayan. Mr. Anant Narayan is an international banking and financial markets expert. He was previously Standard Chartered Bank's regional head of financial markets for Asia and South Asia, managing foreign currency, interest rates, commodities, derivatives, and debt capital markets business across 12 countries, and currently a professor in the SPJ Institute of Management and Research. Welcome, Anant, and forward to Anant. Thank you so much, Venki, sir. Uh, really appreciate. Um, congratulations, Tiago, sir, and the entire SIFX team. Uh, superb inauguration. Couldn't catch all of it, but fantastic stuff. As the CEA said, uh, we're looking forward to great things coming from you. And uh, special congratulations for getting together such a lovely panel. Uh, you've made my job extremely easy. I'm going to throw all the tough questions to these uh, 
for uh, bakras out here and we're going to squeeze whatever information they have out of this so a couple of uh, rules of uh, the game obviously quiz masters uh, discussion is final so that that overriding factor always remains because it's a webinar and we can't fight with each other uh, and and speak over each other i will still encourage you to jump in if you have any points to make to previous questions so when i throw a question at you if you have a point on on a previous question especially if you want to disagree with the previous member please jump in the closer we can get to an arnab kind of a show I, i'll be happier so extra points to you if you can disagree violently with each other so what i'll do is in no particular order i see adarsh in my in the center of my screen adarsh uh, welcome and thank you for joining this uh, this panel i'm going to start with the global context completely unfair question 12 days from now we have the us elections and you also have brexit uh, hanging a fire that's in the center of uh, all of our attention at this point in time do some crystal ball gazing for us and tell us what do we expect what do you expect to happen over the next month or so and are markets over prepared for volatility under prepared how do you reckon things can pan out from here sure thank you anand and um, thanks everyone for for inviting me to to this prestigious panel very happy to be here and it's certainly been very well organized you know i've attended a lot of webinars and you know i haven't seen a lot of them don't go very smoothly and this one certainly has um so to your question i think um obviously the only thing on investors minds right now is the upcoming us election even though you know no one generally has a clue how it's going to play out what i would say is in my conversations with clients over the past month or so people aren't thinking too much about uh, policies under a biden administration versus a trump administration that is really not the issue on investors minds right now the only issue on investors minds is when do we get to know the election result and will we get to know it on election day soon after election day or will it be a prolonged contested election so right now that's the only issue because clearly trump has you know questioned the validity of postal votes um he's he's questioned the the legitimacy of 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 some of the ways that the election is being conducted so if the election result is very tight and because in some states they only validate and count the postal votes after election day then it could be it could be some time before we know the election result um it might be within a week if we wait for some of the swing states to count the ballots it might be a bit later if the result is very tight now the only thing i'll tell you is that if you look at um you know a, a lot of betting markets now have contracts on when the election outcome will be called so if you look at one of these websites predictor.com the probability of the election being called within a week of the election day at the end of september was 65% that's very very low i mean usually the election result is called on election day or within a week of election day but recently that's gone up dramatically and that's gone up dramatically because the polls have moved in favor of biden particularly in the major battleground states so right now the probability of the election result being known within a week after the election is somewhere between 80 to 85% and that's certainly where the consensus has shifted i think based on what the polls are telling us most investors believe that we will know the the election results soon after election day and that resolution of uncertainty should be positive for risk it should be negative for the us dollar um, it should lead to higher us rates as people anticipate a, a big fiscal stimulus ad, under biden administration and a potential democrat sweep of congress Now there's only one concern I have here which is you know 80 to 85% sounds a bit high to me because the the one swing state that has been validating it vote its votes ahead of the election and will count the votes on election day is Florida and you know even for people who don't follow the US election you know Florida is always a very important swing state and within all the major battleground states the polls are tightest in Florida between Biden and Trump So there is a possibility you know for Trump to have any chance of winning the election he has to take Florida and there's the possibility that on election day we you know we will know the Florida result and there is a small possibility that Trump could take Florida in which case at the very least we have to wait for a week for some of the other swing states to count the postal votes now that's a concern for me on election day for those of you who are you know thinking about it from a short term perspective what does it mean for volatility i think at this point if we had any uncertainty surrounding the outcome of the election on election day that is not priced in markets are not prepared for that the volatility premium that we look at in in vix futures or in fx options market has come down over the past 2 to 3 weeks so i would say at this point the pain trade as far as the us election is concerned is if for whatever reason and i'm not you know i'm not forecasting the election i don't know what's going to happen but if we don't know the result that's a problem as far as brexit is concerned i i don't have too much to say you know this is like uh, you know a drama series that has uh, many many seasons 
And we're now in the 18th or 19th season, and it is going to continue for a while. Obviously, I, I think talks will continue, and you know, Sterling has benefited from that news that we've had over the past 24 to 48 hours. But look, make, make no mistake about it. Whatever deal the UK and the EU reach, it's going to be a bad deal for the UK. It's not going to be a deal where they have access to the single market. They still have to negotiate trade deals with other countries. It's going to be a problem for the UK. Is it going to be a problem for, for a lot of you sitting, you know, sitting in India and looking in, at India markets? Probably not. I guess, obviously, the US election is, is going to be a lot more important. Hey, thank you so much, Adarsh. I think you've set a fantastic context for the immediate short term. Uh, Sajid, let me come to you next. Set the stage for us from the global context perspective. Now that Adarsh has taken care of the short term, <clears throat> unless you want to disagree with him violently, uh, but set the stage for us for, for the global context over the next one year, two year, so that we can then segue to India. Yeah, uh, thanks, Anand. Uh, no, just to follow very briefly with what Adarsh said, uh, you know, only because I lived in the U.S. for 15 years and I follow uh, U.S. politics perhaps closer than I do Indian politics. Um, I, I think what's different this time around, remember why the polls were so wrong in 2016, right? There were multiple reasons. But one of the reasons the swing state polls were wrong but they weren't adequately weighting uh, college education. Now, remember, the second most important criteria in determining voter behavior is whether you have a college degree or not. The first, of course, is which party you're affiliated to. And what some of these you know, state polls were doing were oversampling uh, college educated voters because they're the ones who tend to respond to polls, pick up phone calls, uh, you know, and, and therefore and those tend to vote disproportionately democratic uh, uh, while the lower non-college educated uh, white voters in particular tend to vote Republican and those were being undersampled. Now, hopefully, you know, four years later, you can never say never, uh, the polls have at least made some of those basic corrections. And the only thing I think that's quite striking uh, is that many, many different paths to victory that Biden has. I think the fact that President Trump two weeks before the election is campaigning in Georgia and Arizona, right, and Iowa, these are reliably Republican states tells you that Biden has many paths to victory. Uh, he can lose Florida, uh, he can lose North Carolina, uh, of course he can lose Arizona and still win. So I think the only point I'll add to the excellent points that were made before is that given the numerous paths to victory, there is, an, there is a not trivial probability here that on election night, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, even though he's lost Florida, you know, he, you win a, you spring a surprise in Arizona or other Midwestern states, and the and the and the trend line is so overwhelmingly Democratic, right? If we're talking about a blue wave, that the the likelihood of a contested election may actually be a little bit lower than we worried about a month ago or six weeks ago. Now, all of that said, I think tomorrow morning India Times crucial. It's the third debate or the second debate, and perhaps Trump's real last real opportunity to to turn things around. What does this mean for the macros, Anand? Um, you know, um, I, I think we need to be careful how we interpret the data because I think I'm seeing a lot of excitement globally and people are conflating a V-shaped recovery in growth rates with a V-shaped recovery in the levels of output, which is what matters. We're seeing a very strong third quarter globally, you know, quarter on quarter, 35% annualized. We're seeing a strong retail consumer in the US. There's a lot of fuel in the tank because of the fiscal transfers that is being spent in terms of retail consumption in the third quarter and in the fourth quarter. But I think let's go back to what the World Economic Outlook told us less than a week ago, that the degree of scarring here is still going to be meaningful. And the scarring I talk about in terms of permanent output that's lost over the next two years, over the next five years, because of small medium enterprises that have shut down, because of jobs that have been lost, because of balance sheets that have been damaged. And I think two numbers uh, stand out for me. One is the total lost output for the IMF. And when they talk about lost output, what they're saying is, what is the output over the next two years compared to what we thought it would be pre-pandemic? That's about 11 trillion, but that's not the scary number. The scary number is that lost output continues to increase over the next five years to about $28 trillion. So really what that's telling us is it's not just damage this year or next year, but the permanency of this is going to last over the next three years. And uh, you know the numbers they use is, for the top 10 developed economies, uh, potential GDP will be 3.5% below what they thought it would be pre-pandemic. For the top 10 emerging markets, is 5.5%. These are large numbers. This is deep scarring in, in DMs and EMs. Now, so I think that is the baseline we need to work with. Despite all the excitement about this quarter, next quarter, we're going to see deep scars from this crisis. Uh, I'll end with two um, upside risks here. To the extent that a blue wave uh, does materialize, there's a big if, of course, for all the reasons we've mentioned, 
I think there are two things to keep in mind. One is the uh, quantum of the fiscal package that we could see could be very large. I mean, it, you know, our own senses that growth in the U.S. could be tracking 4% next year if we contemplate a $3 trillion fiscal package sometime in the first quarter of next year. And I think that could have a catalytic, catalytic impact on the rest of the world. If the U.S. economy is booming at 4% next year, that is going to be positive for the world. The second is what happens to U.S.-China geopolitics, because I think under a Biden administration, you will see a much more multilateral, less transactional approach to China. Our own sense is that uh, you know, there'll be a truce on the trade deal. Of course, the great power conflict will continue in technology, but I think the, you know, the Democrats may well negotiate giving some concessions on trade uh, if, if China opens up its market towards services. So both these things are good for the global economy. Less uncertainty, a more multilateral approach to China, and a large fiscal stimulus which buffers the shock of the virus. Uh, and, and so I think that's what we need to kind of focus on uh, looking forward. Uh, superb, Sajid, as ever. Uh, and thank you for putting that. And it's a very nice segue, the point you made about the possibility of a second fiscal stimulus. Pranjal, I'm going to come to you next. I'm not a student of economics uh, as, as you are, but whatever I've heard in the past when I was growing up was, you know, be f fiscally frugal, monetary policy has to be conservative, uh, don't print money. All of that has seems to have gone out of the window as far as developed markets are concerned. We are now talking about yield curve control. We are talking about QE infinity. We are talking about you know forget about austerity. Has DM economics been rewritten and is this permanent? And a segue to that uh, is is inflation in developed markets dead? I mean we don't need to worry about it anymore. It's a, it's a thing of the past. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anand. So, you know, if the frequency of these sort of crisis events is only going to increase globally, uh, then I think, uh, you know, the authorities are going to do a lot of innovation in the policy tools. And that's exactly what we see now. And all these fancy words, you know, from MMT, modern monetary theory, to YCC, yield control, uh, to QE infinity, you know, all of this, I think, is a part of that same thinking, is a part of that same package. So what really is, you know, modern monetary theory? It basically says, that uh, if inflation is not a problem in your country, then just print money. Don't bother about high public debt. Uh, you know, that is the economic definition. I think a more simple definition is it's a crisis. Go and do whatever you can to save growth. So uh, I think that's where it really comes from. If you uh, hear about no more austerity, I think the last couple of weeks there has been a clarion call from everywhere, IMF, BIS, you know, saying that, look, this whole fiscal support can't just be a one-year phenomenon. It has to be a multi-year phenomenon. In the past, you know, we've made mistakes in which we just took it off prematurely, like, you know, perhaps in the Eurozone, uh, and that really hurt. This time, let it be out there for longer. I think that's really the thinking around this whole, you know, no more austerity. In fact, you know, academics like Adam Posen have been writing things like, you know, Democrats uh, over tighten after a crisis. So there's a lot of like, you know, thinking around how long should the fiscal stimulus stay in the system. A yield curve control, of course, is the, is the monetary policy innovation on that front, which basically says that, look, you know, we, we need to cap rates at a time when some of the other things are not really working out. For instance, negative nominal interest rates are turning out to be pretty costly in the countries that have gone with it. Yield curve control is probably easier to do. It's sort of coming in vogue. So, look, all of this is great, and I understand where it's coming from. But the truth is that it comes with its own risks. You know, it comes with its own slippery slope. And each of these countries will have to monitor some of the risks very carefully. Uh, to your point on inflation, is DM inflation dead? Well, uh, the, the, the honest answer is we don't know. You know, the world is changing so quickly. Uh, the pandemic, you know, we've not had this kind of situation in the last hundred years. We don't really know. But you know, probably a better answer is that, look, it's perhaps not a short term problem. Uh, there's a lot of excess capacity in the world. You know, demand is really falling, but it could become a problem in a sort of a three year horizon because the structure of the world, the rules of the game are changing quite a lot. You know, wages are rising in China. Uh, trade is shrinking to some extent. Protectionism is rising. Uh, you know, there are so many different issues that are going on that uh, it could be something that comes and haunts you and comes very quickly uh, before you know really you know what 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 really hit you. So we can't really um, you know avoid that. Then there are some other problems like how do you exit from something like a yield curve control? 
you know, you could exit from uh, no fake tapering and all of that because the quantum was small. A lot of it happened organically. But when you have such policy innovations, how do you really exit? So there are all of these issues that, you know, can't be ignored. I wanted to end by sharing a few thoughts on emerging markets. Uh, look, emerging markets like ourselves, you know, look at all of this and we are like, whoa, this is so interesting. Should we try some of this? But the truth is, I think we have to understand where we are. Many of these developed economies have had all of these institutional frameworks like inflation targeting, like fiscal rules for a very long time. They've done the hard work of abiding by these rules when the going was tough. And I think at this point, they've sort of you know, found themselves some space to actually do some policy innovation in a careful manner. I think many of the EMs are early birds here. You know, we inflation targeting for in India, for example, it's, you know, it's just been the last just two, three years uh, or so. So, you know, I don't think we really won ourselves this space to do a lot of policy policy innovation. Also, we do have a lot of uh, limitations. I think for India, the biggest limitation is inflation. You know, we're probably an outlier in the world right now, seeing such high inflation at a time when, you know, growth is so weak. Then we have other problems, for example, implementation capacity on the ground. Today, we could have a very huge fiscal support package, but will it really reach the right people on the ground? And then we have a third kind of, you know, uh, limitations. For example, how do you come out of very high fiscal deficit? We know that our tax to revenue ratio is, is not very great and you know things like GST how it's going is not looking very promising so emerging markets like India have to be careful you know when we look at you know what the world is world is doing great points uh, Pr uh, Pranjul really appreciate that so you're making a distinction between DM and EM and that's a great segue to you Samir Samir great to see you again my friend uh, long time all the points about the uh, global context, if you want to add to that, uh, the floor is yours. But I'd also like to segue you to India. What does all this mean for India? What is the crystal ball for India? If you can help set the context for Indian economics, that would be great. Uh, Samir, all yours. Uh, well, good to see you, uh, Anand. Uh, look, I mean, all the points which Adarsh and, and Sajid and Pranjul have made, uh, uh, I mean, I guess just a point to add to for kind of giving more, uh, less of context, but rather a bit more of color, I would kind of go out on a limb and argue that for all the moves which have happened in markets, and I know for a lot of us in financial markets, it kind of feels like there has been this massive and often fairly poorly understood risk rally. I would say, I would go out on a limb and say financial markets are actually still underappreciating what a, a shift in administration in the US and one to uh, a Biden administration and particularly one which is a Biden administration with a blue wave could actually mean for global appetite. So kind of a bit reiterating the points uh, Sajidun making, but I would argue very strongly that what is still not, I would say, very well in the price in, in global assets is the fact that that administration means two very important things. One, it means a shift on both foreign and trade policy to a much more multilateralist approach than the one we have seen over the last four years, which will dramatically reduce geopolitical risk premium and that matters very particularly for emerging markets so i'll try and take that round that up to what it means for example with this part of the world and and and, and in india and second of course the fact that in party that depends of course on what the composition of the house ends up being but uh, of the congress ends up being but uh, certainly a, a democratic sweep could mean very significant things in terms of a combination of policy which is very fiscally expansionary and stimulatory, but also, and I think very important, and as in contrast with what happened back in 2016-17, combined with a Federal Reserve, which is likely to stay very accommodative for a long period of time. We must remember that that is a big change from back in 16-17. This is not a Fed which has spent time having built up its entire thought process on the average inflation targeting to actually back away from that anytime soon. A combination of that could actually be very stimulatory. Uh, and I would go so far as to argue that unlike what people believe, in fact, a Biden presidency with a, a, a split Congress could actually go the same way uh, in terms of being stimulatory, not so much in terms of necessarily fiscal policy, but the fact that that would give even less reason for the Fed to back away from its ultra accommodative stance. And ultimately, both scenarios leading to my mind, very importantly, we are in a forex forum, so I'll kind of bring it down to that, very importantly to being uh, very bearish for the dollar. And now why that is very important to then bring it onto the Indian context is because what is bearish for the dollar 
typically and in contrast can actually become fairly stimulatory for a lot of particularly the cyclical currencies in emerging markets uh, and particularly in terms of capital flows. Now, one of the big, one of the interesting characteristics I would argue of this year has been that while this crisis, very similar to like in 09, in fact, far more so than in 09, has led to this extraordinary expansion in balance sheets of developed central banks, especially the Fed. But what it has not done is actually led to a shift in global capital from these developed markets into emerging markets, unlike what happened uh, post 2009. Now, what that what can change, therefore, and what matters, for example, for places like India, what can change, therefore, is uh, that if we actually do see a big move down in the dollar, that it actually becomes self-feeding in terms of actually starting to shift a lot more risk allocation towards emerging markets. And now, India very specifically, I guess just a couple of points to make. Look, India started or uh, went into this crisis, let's admit it, with a big disadvantage, uh, both in terms of sort of where we were as part of the cycle because of the credit crisis we've been kind of dealing with, which in any way had a big paucity on growth, uh, if you might. But we also went in, of course, with a disadvantage that our infrastructure, particularly our medical infrastructure, was always very under-equipped to be able to tackle a problem like the COVID crisis. And therefore, there is no doubt that we've seen the kind of demand shock India has faced as a result of this uh, particular crisis. I think uh, it's responded from a policy perspective, similarly to what other places have done. Much of the rest of the world has obviously responded much more aggressively with monetary policy than it has done with fiscal. I think in the case of India, we've had a particular constraint in terms of how much the sovereign balance sheet can further. I would argue the context in which is where the key case lies ahead is how to be able to manage that balance between how much further we are able to stimulate through the fiscal angle and demand management angle and how much scope one has versus funding that through a much better central bank accommodation. I think in the near term, I would argue that there is absolutely no alternative but for central bank to accommodate uh, a much larger fiscal stimulus uh, to the economy. But I think ultimately also, and going back to the previous point, which Tanjil was addressing, ultimately also then leads to more medium to long term issues around whether this accommodation will lead to much greater financial and inflation risks down the line. Look, uh, to my mind, this debate is very live and very premature to judge, which is whether this is a much bigger supply shock, in which case it is ultimately going to be inflationary, or is it a much bigger demand shock, which means it's ultimately going to be deflationary because there's going to be much larger uh, sort of precautionary savings which are built up as a result of this. I have a feeling that we have a little bit of time where we can afford one where uh, fiscal policy has to take much larger step up, particularly in places like India, and central banks and monetary policy can actually afford to accommodate uh, that stimulus. That's not a permanent state of affairs. And what will be very important, therefore, is to sort of move from that one state uh, and where we have actually got from, as your, this thing says, from survival to kind of revival to a point where we then have to turn off those taps. And to your point, YCC can't be forever. MMT is, is a fancy concept, but has very little application, particularly in emerging market uh, context, I would argue. And, and to that extent, when do we actually shift from there to one where we, we have to be clear that it does not lead to much longer, sort of longer term inflation and financial, financial contagion risks. Great. Thanks a lot, Samir. Uh, lots of great takeaways. What I figured out, uh, Adarsh was talking about the fact that maybe volatility is underpriced. Uh, and both Sajid and you seem to be pointing out that, you know what, there could be an upside uh, as far as risk is concerned if you actually have a blue wave along those lines. And a, a great context on India. We will pick up the monetary and fiscal points that you made, and, and I do want to go into that. But Sajid, coming to you, uh, you've been making the point uh, quite regularly that we need growth to come out of the current predicament. You know, a lot of what we decide to do on monetary and fiscal, et cetera, is predicated on how we manage growth. Give me a, a kind of a, a, a telescopic view of why is it that growth has been such a challenge for us over the last few years? And what is it that you see happening over the next, the, the revival part that Tiago Sar is, is mentioning? What can bring growth into the, into the equation uh, going forward? Thanks, Anand. Great question. So, you know, to look ahead, we first have to look back to understand what was the state of the economy coming into COVID 
how are some of those fissures being exacerbated and therefore what should the uh, appropriate policy action be? And I think a good useful um, for analytical framework is to look at the expenditure side of GDP, you know, consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. I know it's macro 101, but often these things are best understood until you're a professor by going back to first principles. So let's, let's first understand, India's had two growth cycles, right? Uh, 2002 to 2010, uh, eight, eight and a half, nine percent growth. Uh, and 2014 to 19, about 7 percent, but qualitatively very different drivers of growth. 2002 to 2001 was the classical Asian cycle. India almost became China. Exports grew at about 17, 18 percent a year. It was the era of hyper globalization. And people don't realize it was really exports that drove investment. Investment created jobs and jobs drove consumption. But exports grew at 18 percent a year. Investment at about 13 to 14 percent. Consumption grew at 6 or 7 percent. And so by its very nature, that growth was sustainable because capacities were created, you know, core inflation was low. Now, growth in the last six years, for understandable reasons, given that the global economy had slowed, protectionism in the rise, was driven by consumption. Consumption grew at about 7% a year for the last five or six years. What's less appreciated is not much of that consumption was organically driven by underlying income growth. A lot of that consumption was driven by households running down their savings and taking on debt. Now, this is understandable. We're a young economy. If you believe your lifetime prospects are strong, you will do what economists call consumption smoothing. You will borrow now uh, uh, to repay later and consume now uh, to, to, to repay later. That works in the good times. In the good times, uh, households will tend to run their savings down. But what we saw in the last three years was as the economy began to slow from 2016 to 19, um, whether households perceive the slowdown to be transient or permanent has huge implications for behavior. And by the third year of the slowdown, you could sense that households were getting a little bit wary about medium term prospects and had begun to cut back on consumption. Right. So 2019-20, private consumption slows quite materially because households were perhaps worried about the medium term and were reversing some of this behavior. Instead, the government had to step in. So another phenomenon that people don't fully appreciate is government spending in the last three years before COVID grew at about 11% a year. We had not seen this even in the global financial crisis. Government spending was twice as strong as the private sector. In the last year before COVID, government spending was four times as strong as the private sector. Um, now, so, so if private consumption has begun to slow because of household behavior, exports have been choppy, exports have only grown about 3% a year for the last five years, it's understandable if C is not firing and X is not firing, that I will not fire. So the three quarters before COVID, you see um, capacity utilization in the RBI's household surveys are below 70% for two consecutive quarters for the first time since the survey was introduced and gross fixed capital formation actually uh, contracts. So again, consumption had begun to slow. Exports were choppy and not giving much confidence, which is why investment had begun to slow. And the government was doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the previous three years going into this crisis, which is why the public sector borrowing requirement that all of us have spoken about, Anand, you've discussed it, Pranjal, as I have, was about 10% of GDP. And that was the state of the economy. Now, if you dive me for 60 seconds more, if that's your starting point, now think about all these drivers going forward. To the extent that households believe that the COVID shock could be quasi-permanent, right? Uh, uh, because jobs have been lost, uh, um, SMEs have been shut down, incomes and wages will be hit. You will see that going forward, they will get even more risk averse. You only have to look at the household surveys, the consumer confidence surveys of the RBI. And I think the key element in that survey is when households are asked, where will spending be one year ahead? And you see that in the last few surveys, spending one year ahead is much, much lower than pre-COVID levels. So the perceived permanence of the shock will cause households to retrench for the foreseeable future till they have more confidence about the future jobs and wages. Similarly, for all the reasons we've mentioned globally, an incomplete recovery globally, notwithstanding the fiscal stimulus in the US, will mean there is no conviction on export growth. So again, if exports uh, uh, you know, aren't firing in the coming years, consumption retrenches, uh, savings rates go up, there will be no necessary motivation for investment to pick up. And that's the bind we find ourselves in, which is why you know, I've been personally advocating that this is the time where you require a 
classical counter-cyclical Keynesian stimulus. India needs a big infrastructure push over the next four to six quarters because infrastructure spending is large multipliers. It will crowd in private investment. It is labor intensive, so it creates jobs and certainty uh, in terms of household incomes, and it boosts medium term growth. And how do you pay for it? For, you know, my own sense is if we were to aggressively sell assets over the next three years. That's a fiscally neutral way of imparting a policy stimulus. So I think that's the bind, not just India, other emerging markets find that if you get more protectionism and nativism globally, so global trade doesn't bounce back. And if um, you get uncertainty prolonging because of the virus and households begin to perceive the COVID shock as being permanent around the world, you will see savings rates go up, consumption rates go down. So how will emerging markets grow if domestic consumption takes a beating, exports aren't lifting, there will be no motivation uh, for investment to pick up. And that's the real irony that the paradox will be many of these emerging markets have used up fiscal space in, in the crisis. But fiscal may well have to do the heavy lifting, even in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. Uh, thanks so much, Sajid. So I guess your point is we need investments to pick up now. And, and the, probably the only way to do it is through the government uh, by doing asset sales uh, matched by that by part. Uh, great points. Uh, Adesh, I'm going to come to you next. We're not seeing too much of fiscal spending at this point in time, at least from the Indian, Indian uh, perspective. Uh, instead, we're seeing a lot of uh, reforms. So you've seen labor reforms, you've seen agri reforms, you've seen those production linked incentives coming through. And we saw the tax cuts coming in the last year. Uh, I guess there's a supply side, classical supply side, let's try and get private uh, jobs uh, up and running. What is your sense and, and what do your investors that you speak to tell you about uh, their perception of Indian reforms? Does this path that the government seems to have picked up lead us to growth, productivity, jobs and output? Sure. Um, so, so, so look, I think over the past few years, a lot of reform measures have been taken, as you suggested. Um, I, I think investors generally understand that supply side reform takes time. And, you know, particularly some aspects of, of reform, like land reform, have probably been a bit slower than people might have expected. Uh, but obviously, now you've had, um, you know, this COVID shock hit um, at a time where you could argue the focus should shift to demand side measures, um, as, as the previous uh, panelists were suggesting. But I think the supply side reform has to continue. And, and I think one of the reasons the supply side reform has to continue is that if we're talking about, uh, and India is not the only country talking about, you know, a made in India or make for India policy. But if you're doing that and you, you, you want more direct investment and investment to, to pick up, supply side reform is part and parcel of that. You need land reform, of course, to, to accelerate. I think, you know, for, for something like making India to pick up, you don't necessarily need all of India to be a manufacturing base, but of course you could have things like special economic zones that focus on manufacturing. Of course, labor, labor reform is very important. I think one thing that's interesting in India is you have only, I, I think 11% of the labor force that's in manufacturing. When you compare that to other countries at their peak of manufacturing, it was more like 30% of the labor force that, that was part of manufacturing. So I, I think um, you know, supply side reform should continue alongside, you know, fiscal stimulus, demand side type measures. I think the other problem, you know, going back to some of the points that were discussed before, we all know that real interest rates in India have been probably too high for too long. And clearly that's curtailed the investment side of things. And of course, you know, inflation, you know, um, as, as Samir said, inflation, India is one of the few countries where inflation has been high, but we all recognize it's supply side driven inflation. And, you know, I, I recognize that it's um, easier for developed market central banks to ignore supply side inflation than it is for emerging market central banks. But nonetheless, just given the context, the size of the demand shock, given that, as Sajid said, COVID could be a quasi permanent shock. Um, I think to some extent, the central bank um, can and probably should look through the supply side driven rise in inflation um, and do everything they can to try and bring down real interest rates. And of course, they have been doing that through, you know, through their through providing a calendar for open market operations, through increasing the HTM limit. Uh, we do anticipate great cuts by the RBI down the line. And I think that's going to be an important part of the recovery process as well. So, yes, fiscal is important and should be done. And, and things like infrastructure, especially productive infrastructure, would be very important. But I think that there's still a role for accommodative monetary policy at this point, despite the fact that we've seen higher inflation. Thanks a lot, Adarsh. Uh, that's very well put. Uh, Pranjal, I'm going to come to you next. I, I guess uh, I heard Samir and, and, and Sajid um, talk about the need for the FISC to do a lot more. Uh, Samir suggested on rates as well. Adarsh is singing from the same hymn sheet. Do you agree with this? And I guess the segue to that is, 
what what do you think what do you reckon rating agencies are going to make out of all of this uh, if we, if we do go on the path of uh, you know spending more on the fisc monetary easing and one last quick point on the reforms part one of the worries that people have had is that india might be going inward with this atmanirbhar bharat you know, kind of protectionism joke that worry you when you speak to your investors it does that come up as a theme all of this put together one kichli for you i'm going to try so you know on on fiscal i think there is space to spend more especially when it comes to social welfare schemes you know because these are real lives and real livelihoods uh, i think we've done a bit on rural livelihoods but i feel we've done nothing on urban livelihoods and that's something which uh, you know which needs some action the other thing i uh, you know I, i really believe what sajid said is public capex it basically ticks so many boxes it you know gives you jobs today it has all of these forward linkages backward linkages to other sectors like steel and cement and it also builds up you know your supply capacity for tomorrow or uh, you know for all the people who are worried about inflation so you know capex is just such a wonderful thing uh, at this point as in uh, you know there's no doubt about it and there are also innovative ways to do it for example via you know disinvestment via asset monetization that it doesn't really have to add up to fiscal deficit so from that sense i think a lot more can be done on fiscal policy but having said that you know we sort of always talk about fiscal policy monetary policy but there is like something about you know uh, working creatively uh, working in a new innovative way which is something we haven't really seen uh, you know in 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 my view coming out of this crisis so let me give you one example how do you get more bank for the same buck that you're spending the, why hasn't the center been able to uh, you know do for forge partnerships with states more effectively dovetail some of the programs ensure that there's no double spending or ensure that you know some places don't go completely hungry so you know there could have been far more integration that we that you know especially for a country like india which doesn't have too much money to spend we could have done much more of the sort of integrated strategy which we didn't the second is on reforms i feel like you know in the last couple of years we really generated some good institutions you know gst in fashion targeting ibc i think this is the time when we actually need ibc the most because what has this pandemic done for you it has basically split the world in two halves you know everybody talks about this two speed recovery in which some sectors are doing well and this are some sectors are not doing well and now is the time to actually reallocate capital from sectors that are not doing well and put it to sectors that are doing well so at least the ones that are doing well continue to invest continue to create jobs and growth keeps rolling but what we've done when we need ibc the most is put it in cold storage now it's true that there were some norms in the ibc which were too too tough but you could have worked creatively around that you could have sort of made some exceptions but completely putting it on in cold storage was perhaps not the right thing to do you know one thing i liked about atmanirbhar let me you know come to that now was um, i think there was generally an intention that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity when uh, supply chains around the world are getting rejected and india can be a part of global uh, supply chains in in a way they've never been in the past so i think that was good but i think what the apanirbhar package fell short of was really outlining a proper strategy which had you know all the ease of doing business reforms that are needed the land reforms which others spoke about uh, perhaps you know power sector reforms uh, perhaps transport infrastructure reforms it wasn't really a full uh, package and in some sense i'm i'm scared that it smells a little bit like what we heard back in 2014 the make in india you know it's not that after we announced make in india manufacturing as a percent of gdp went up it actually unfortunately went down so so you know there are a few things i liked about atmanirbhar i know it sounds self you know it sort of talks about inward policy but it was followed up by a lot of people from the government you know talking about how they want to be a part of global supply chain going forward but i didn't see any details that you know that made me really excited i do think that these continue to remain amazing opportunities for us and if we move fast we can do a lot there thanks a lot pranjal um, samir coming to you couple of sets of questions one is of course a segue from what pranjul mentioned you know on atmanirbhar bharat we have seen things like this production linked incentives uh, there's also to others point about land there's also a promise of a single window clearance coming up sometime early next year which hopefully will provide land to who wants to invest are you seeing positive feedback from investors about about these outreaches do you see electronics coming as a as a big manufacturing hub and therefore growth coming in in some form or the other 
The second question is about what you were speaking about on the fiscal and monetary part, and I, I didn't let you finish that time. How much more do you think the government needs to spend, and do you endorse the views given earlier about the need for more spending? And how much more room do you think monetary policy has in India to, to actually support? Um, sure, um, Arun. So, I, I mean, on the first part, look, I mean, uh, what are investors saying about the Atman River plans? I, I guess I'll echo a bit of what Pranjit was saying, which is, I think the biggest problem, if you find, I mean, you had indicated earlier in the communication we were having, what is the good, the bad, or the ugly. I mean, I think instead of the good, bad, ugly, I'll say the big problem about Atman River is we just don't know enough. I think the problem is with the communication. It's nice to have a big slogan. There's nothing wrong with it. But what we don't know enough is what is being done sort of to back that up. And I'll give you a context. I'll give you a context. When foreign invest, when global pools of capital look at where they want to deploy that money, they are looking for actual plans. And I'll give you a context of somewhere here in the region, which we are often very compared to. For example, a place like Indonesia, which has just over the last few weeks, pass this massive omnibus law, which essentially takes care of not one, not two, not 10, but hundreds of such small regulations in one sweeping kind of way. Now, without going into necessarily the details of what was necessarily right or wrong with what they have done, but my point is, ultimately, uh, so proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? you, you need to be able to back up a lot of these plans with what is actually put in, in place. And I think that's one where I would say it's still work in progress. I would not uh, decry it, but I would certainly say it's work in progress. On the monetary fiscal angle, uh, look, I, yeah, I would definitely endorse and I kind of partly repeat myself earlier point. I mean, at the crisis we find ourselves in, uh, I, I think what's very important to understand here is that is this a crisis which is primarily supply driven crisis is a primarily a supply shock because in that instance you will have to worry about the fact that it will very quickly lead to a big as supply functions uh, normalize it will lead to a very massive uh, sort of inflationary shock and that would cut short the ability of policymakers to be able to continue to support the economy or on the other hand like what I think Sajid was very clearly alluding to that is this much more of a demand shock, which has sort of a semi-permanent nature, will change the behavior of economic agents towards how they think about savings and will therefore, at least for a while, have a very dramatic shift in the entire savings investment balance, which, by the way, also correlates to our current account gap and why the currency is seeing so much more appreciation pressure, but will certainly bring to for the fact that we have got a period here. I don't know how long that period is, but I would argue that we have got a space here. We are afforded a space here where we can certainly run with much larger, but very importantly, the good quality fiscal stimulus and which needs to be backed up very adequately with central bank accommodation. So yes, I would argue that much as we are all caught in numerical inflation targeting and about where policy rate should be versus inflation, I think this is exactly the time where we need to put in the flexible in the flexible inflation targeting framework and would allow for real rates to be a lot more negative and stimulatory in order to be able to accommodate this uh, sort of demand management uh, program. Uh, does do will we come to a point where we will tip over and where we will need to be able to contain? I would argue yes. The governments do need to pay for the money they are borrowing and a right cost of capital. I think in the near term we have got space, and I hope that over the next few months we are still at a point where RBI backs up its forward guidance, which seems to be wanting to uh, get into to be able to cap yields in one form or the other. But yes, eventually uh, yields will have to rise to reflect the true demand supply of uh, capital in the system. And just on that, the final point to make what Sajid was alluding to earlier about the need for much more infrastructure spending. Ultimately, we can't get away from the fact that we are a savings deficit economy. And therefore, there is no better way than to tap into the global pool of capital. And when we tap into the global pool of capital, we cannot be selective. We cannot say we want money just for this or just for that. You need to be able to make global investors comfortable with investments, whether it is by way of access to curves, whether it's access to hedging instruments, whether it's access to liquidity, or indeed whatever else is required, very particularly supply side reforms and all the other enabling regulations. But I think India to be able to get back to its path of which was unfortunately and rudely got interrupted by this crisis, I think we need to be able to get back to thinking about how we can utilize 
what has actually become now much cheaper global capital for long periods of time. I mean, when was the last time uh, the, the biggest central bank in the world was telling you that they are not going to be moving rates for the next three years? This is a great opportunity to be able to tap into the global pool of capital to be able to bridge that gap on savings which we have and be able to channel that into productive, productive investment. So sorry, uh, long story short, definitely a time to be able to get much more fiscal stimulus and actually be able to accommodate that through more monetary easing, I would argue. Thanks a lot, uh, Samir. Adarsh, I'm going to come to you next uh, very quickly. We've seen this dichotomy between markets and economics uh, practically everywhere, and it's kind of heightened in India as well, right? You're probably going to see double-digit contraction, and yet Nifty is at 12,000. Of course, FX is seeing very large flows as well. Um, you know, bond markets are, are... So is this two-track, you know, ec economics going in one way and all of us screaming blue murder on, on, on one side and the markets having their own party. Is this going to continue for a while? Do you see this dichotomy? Where does, does it converge at all? And if it does converge, what converges to what? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, look, I think, you know, at least for the foreseeable future, the dichotomy continues because the cost of capital and global interest rates are so low. I mean, just going back to Samir's point, I think the point about India trying to tap the global pool of capital is extremely important because for every big asset manager that you speak to these days, that's all they think about, which is the search for yield. Just to give you an, an anecdote, for instance, you're know, speaking to a big Japanese asset manager we had, you know, who typically invests in liquid bond markets like the US. Um, and recently they've started looking at China because there's, you know, there's yield and it's a large market and access has become easier. And then at the end of the conversation, he said, oh, you know, we've, we've never really looked at the India bond, bond market, but we want to start thinking about that and looking, that, uh, looking at that a bit more. I think the bottom line here is that global asset managers that are not getting yield in their typical um, highly rated liquid bond markets will increasingly look to other countries where there is yield and where there is credible policy and regulatory frameworks and so forth. And I think India does stand to benefit from that. So I think from a you know, from, you know, from a policy standpoint, whatever can be done over time, of course, not immediately, to access that global, global pool of capital is extremely important. Now, as far as the dichotomy between financial markets and the economy goes, look, I, I think if I think about India, for instance, I mean, obviously, you know, yields are higher than the rest of the world for a reason. Uh, you know, limited access by foreign investors is one, and, and of course, inflation is high and so forth. Um, if I think about the equity market, I mean, Indian equities have historically traded expensive relative to EM stock markets. I think the average over time, when you look at valuations in you know, India stocks have traded about you know, 41% over the rest of EM in terms of valuation. But right now that's even higher. Right now it's something like 46 to 47% over the rest of EM in terms of valuation metrics. So you know, the Indian stock market you know, does look expensive, but you know, again, it's looked expensive over time when you compare it to its EM peers. So, and of course, as far as the currency is concerned, it's purely balance payment story. India is recording its biggest balance of payment surplus in, in years. So I, I think, you know, people understand um, the macro risks, but, you know, given that the cost of capital is so low and given the search for yield that we're seeing globally, you know, I think whether it's in, in India's case or from a global perspective, you know, this can continue for quite some time. Even if you think about equities versus bonds, you know, equities look, quite expensive by most measures, such as PE measures, but equities look very, very cheap relative to bonds when you compare your equity dividend yield versus bond yields. So again, you know, there, there are lots of ways you can spin the story to say that, you know, equities are actually not that expensive given, you know, given where bond deals are right now. So I think it continues for some, you know, you know for some time. I, I do think, you know, once we come out of this crisis, then investors will start to um, differentiate a bit more based on fundamentals. Um, I think this is quite important for global bond markets because in some ways, you know, countries and EMs in particular doing big fiscal stimulus um, have safety in numbers because everyone's doing it. But at some point, you know, when, you know, once we get out of this crisis, investors will start to think about, you know, where's the deterioration in fiscal dynamics more permanent? Where is nominal GDP growth not picking up? And where does that bring up debt sustainability questions as an example. And by the way, you asked earlier about rating agencies. You know, we've had a few calls with rating agencies. I mean, not just about India, but other countries as well. And, you know, to some extent they say, you know, we're giving the benefit of the doubt because, you know, during the COVID crisis, you would expect fiscal deficits to blow up. But we have to see once we get beyond this, you know, how permanent is this, is this deterioration in fiscal deficits. And that's when sort of, I guess, rating agencies will have to make the harder and bigger calls about, you know, whether to actually downgrade countries or not. So I think even rating agencies as well as investors are playing sort of this waiting game to, to wait and see how things play out over time. 
Thanks a lot, Adarsh. Um, Sajid, very quickly to you, I have about five minutes left. What's your prognosis on inflation going forward for India? How do you see that going? Second question is, we are seeing negative real rates right now, depending on how we measure it, 3-4%. There is this question that, you know, are we doing repression out here? Nobody's talking the case of the savers. It's all about borrowers and investments. So is, is there, for a country like ours, is that a problem at all, having such deep negative rates? And do you see any risks to inflation at all going forward? So, yeah. Uh, another great question. So very quickly, I think there are two elements to India's inflation. One is, you know, what, what's happened to food and what's happened to core. And I think the stories that are quite different. The big surprise over the last six months has been core inflation. You look at the momentum in April, May, June, uh, it really spiked. And, and, and there are two hypotheses there. For a moment, there was a bit of an identification challenge because you had you know, core core go from below 4% to almost 6%. And the question was, uh, is this because of an adverse supply shock because of the lockdown and the pandemic? Um, and if the and, and if that was the if that was the reason, you'd you'd be less worried because over time, as the economy began to open, you know the momentum of core inflation would come down. The second hypothesis was, well, we've had a year of nine percent food inflation. Are we seeing that food inflation generalize into core? And if that proved to be true, that was more worrying. Well, thankfully, it is the first hypothesis. If you look carefully at the momentum of core inflation. Over the last three months, we've gone from an annualized momentum of 6% in June to an annualized momentum of 3% in September. Don't be fooled by the year-on-year numbers. These are sluggish by their nature. Uh, you know, core will remain at about 55 for the next four or five months. But what that doesn't reveal is that the momentum has slowed. So at least the working hypothesis is that the sustained and sharp demand shock will, over time, you know, more than overwhelm the supply side shock. I think the bigger uh, puzzle slash worries on the food front, food inflation after many years of being benign is about 9% over the last year. Uh, some of this is just vegetables and that should go away. Uh, but you also have seen these cobweb cycles play out for many high protein items. And you know, month after month, we've been surprised to the upside for food. Again, the working hypothesis is we've had a very strong monsoon, a very strong harvest. Uh, and in the next six months, I think these factors should combine to depress food inflation. I think it's both these issues that as the economy opens up, the supply shock should abate and the fact that food prices should come down, that gives RBI the conviction uh, you know, that inflation is going to moderate and therefore their guidance can go into next year. What's the big risk, Anand? It's the fact that if food does not moderate and food inflation remains sticky, good for farmers, good terms of trade shock for farmers. But remember, in an economy that's recovering in the next few quarters sequentially, and if pricing power is coming back, Right. If food inflation doesn't come down and inflation expectations, one year ahead expectations have picked up quite sharply in the last six months, continue to remain elevated. Is there a chance, you know, three quarters down that food spills over into core? That's the big risk. Very quickly in your larger question, I think, you know, what we're seeing around the world, including with the RBI, is very effective crisis management, uh, you know, introducing new instruments because you've got all these new objectives growth, inflation, the rupee, uh, bond yields, and, and I think they've done this very well. The, the issue is going to be how do you time the exit correctly? And this is not just an RBI problem. It's a Fed problem. It's an ECB problem. It's a BOJ problem. Because we've seen in the past that, you know, if you have all this liquidity sloshing around, uh, um, then, and the economy picks up only slowly, then you get, get to asset price inflation to a point where in some emerging markets, financial stability concerns become an issue. So I would argue that it's not just where deposit rates are one year from now. How do you begin to progressively drain the six, seven trillion of core liquidity so that we don't risk a financial stability concerns down the line? Superb, uh, Sajid. Thanks for that. Uh, Samir, I'm going to come to you. Bond markets, crystal ball gaze for us on the Indian bond markets. How do you see the flows going forward? How do you see monetary policy progressing from here? So going from what Sajid mentioned, how do you see bond yields going from here over the next 12 months? Look, I mean, I think there's still bond markets, Anand, I would argue, is still very much a largely domestic play. I mean, I wish it was a bit more of a global play. And I do think a turn in the dollar could help, like I said, shift, especially post elections. And if there is a Biden win, I would argue that we will see more money coming into emerging markets. I'm not confident that India would necessarily be the biggest recipient of some of those flows. So offshore will be a bigger participant, but this will still largely be a domestic play. I would argue next three to six months, my expectation is that RBI will try and hold fairly firm. This remains a tug of war between markets and 
uh, you know, RBI in terms of whether that 6% sort of cap will hold. I think it will for the next three to six months. But beyond that, if you ask me out 12 months, I would think 10 year yields are going to be probably closer to six and a half uh, than not. I mean, this will probably see, I think steepening is the theme to stay with us for the next several quarters everywhere, but probably a little bit more aggressively, potentially second half of next year in a place like India as that risk premium kind of plays itself through. But I do think near term, next three to six months, RBI should hopefully show more conviction, like I said, to be able to accommodate this sort of bigger fiscal stimulus. Superb, Samir. Um, by the way, anybody wants to disagree, I will do a poll of uh, where you expect one-year rates to be. So you can express a disagreement there. Pranjal, I'm going to close with you with the last question, main question. This was SYFX, the FX part. So tell us about the foreign exchange markets. How do you see? Actually, two questions for you. One is on DXY itself. How do you see that progressing from your CNY has been a big move as well. But more importantly, the Indian markets. How do you see the rupee moving? You've seen, as uh, Adarsh was mentioning as well, you've seen this huge amount of flows coming in. Is it for real? Is it is it durable? Or is it eventually going, going to go back to this you know, current account deficit funded by capital flows kind of a situation? Yeah. Look, our sense is that in uh, GDP in levels uh, will only go back to pre-COVID you know, levels in, in 2022. So until then, you know, if your GDP and your domestic demand is not very strong, then your trade deficit, you know, even if it rises, it may not rise to you know, those big numbers that you were seeing about 12 to 13 billion dollars every month. So in that sense, you know, I think there will be some support on the BOP front. In terms of the capital inflows, you know, while some of them have been quite chunky, you know, driven by like one or two names, uh, the underlying theme also suggests that some of the regular FDI inflows that, uh, you know, India has been seeing even before the pandemic continues. And if the entire world is going to keep monetary policy, fiscal policy loose for longer, then I think capital flows into India could last for longer. So generally speaking, uh, you know, uh, you know, my sense is, that the appreciating trend that we're seeing right now, you know, could continue over the next couple of months. And can I just take a 30 second point? Sure, sure. Please go ahead, Sajid. You know, I, just, I just want to link uh, the current account with the fiscal because, you know, we have to think of the current account. I think Samir alluded to this earlier, uh, you know, not as its proximate factors of exports and imports and oil prices, but ultimately reflecting the savings investment balance. And to the extent that India has is going to run a current account surplus for possibly every quarter this year, what that's telling us is the private sector savings investment surplus is greater than the public sector savings investment deficit. That means the economy has excess savings. Now, the, the, the glass half empty is that symptomatic of weak demand. But the fact that you've got excess savings compounded by strong capital inflows, if you have a BOP surplus of three and a half percent of GDP, that's three and a half percent of GDP of extra savings that can be used to finance higher fiscal support. And if you look at the first six months of the fiscal year, the big worry everybody had six months ago was the RBI will have to monetize a lot of this deficit. How will the extra borrowing be financed? Guess what? We've had about nine and a half trillion in extra government bonds, SDLs and T-bills compared to last year. At least from April to September, the RBI has only have to buy, had to buy 1.6 trillion. Why? Because you've got this extra savings in the economy that can be used to finance larger deficits and think of this as the natural safety valve. So if we do get more fiscal spending, we don't have to be alarmed because you have these savings and a BOP surplus that can be used to finance it in a non-disruptive manner. I think the link between the external sector and the fiscal is sometimes not fully appreciated. Uh, great, Sajid. Thanks for that. Um, we run out of time, but I'm going to do one round of uh, crystal ball gazing. Tiago, sir, you are part of this particular game as well. We're going to have um, each of our panelists and Tiago sir give us uh, their prognosis on a few market factors. So one year down the road, when SYFX uh, invites us again for the next panel discussion, uh, hopefully in person rather than uh, in remote form, where do you see dollar rupee? Where do you see 10-year bonds, India? Where do you see uh, Nifty? Where do you see, what else? Uh, DXY? Shall we go for DXY as well? So let's go with these four. So dollar rupee. Uh, 10 year uh, rupee bonds, Nifty, and DXY. Why don't I start with Sajid? Why don't you go first? Oh gosh, Anant, uh, you know, when I finished my PhD advisor, God bless his soul, said, Son, never predict commodities, currencies, and market variables. It's a month game. <laughs> and you should never ask an economist practical questions like this. <laughs> I'm, I, never. I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you qualitative answers. Listen, for me, a year from now, if GSEC yields are higher, that's good news because it suggests that credit growth is picking up. 
right? And and banks are actually lending, and therefore yields are reflecting that new equilibrium. Uh, on the rupee, I'd simply say the RBI has been looking, at, at least in our sense, at the trade-weighted real effective exchange rate. And so a lot will depend on what happens to the dollar, what happens to the CNY, what happens to other emerging market currencies. And I would say if we get a blue wave and you get both a more multilateral approach and you get a big fiscal stimulus, that's probably dollar negative. So a year from now, if all of this works out, you should get a weaker dollar, pressure on EM currencies to strengthen. I think the central bank will look at a trade weighted basket before deciding. But I think it keep intervening quite aggressively because on a trade weighted basis, we're 15 percent stronger than five years ago. And that's hurting competitiveness. And hopefully if credit growth picking up. That would mean higher equilibrium bond yield. Well, that's uh, nifty and DXY. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I think let's hope and pray that, uh, you know, the economy recovers on track and we don't and, and, and therefore, you know, equity markets uh, are not uh, abruptly disturbed. I like the way Tiago sir is, uh, is laughing away out there in the corner. But anyway, I'm going to come to the last uh, Tiago sir. Adarsh, all yours. Sure. So, so I, I think on rates, I mean, just to reiterate, reiterate what Samir was saying, I think it's pretty, pretty clear that central banks across the world and most importantly, the Fed, uh, will tolerate a good steepening of curves. So obviously, they, they wouldn't like curves to steepen if it's being driven by real rates going up, even though the economic backdrop is weak. But as, all, as long as we see you know, growth picking up next year, the Fed almost certainly, I think, will tolerate a good steepening of the curve. So on U.S. Treasuries, U.S. 10-year Treasuries, uh, we have a pretty aggressive forecast. We think it could be well above 1%. Maybe 1.3, 1.4% in a year's time. And that's going to be driven by initially a recovery in inflation expectations, but ultimately, as the US economy picks up, uh, by a, a recovery of move high in real rates as well. Um, as far as India is concerned and EM more generally, I think that probably means EM curves steepen as well. But because it's a good steepening of the US curve, EM curves will probably not steepen as much. So for, say, 10-year GSEX um, you know, moves back above 6% ultimately, but probably around 6.2%. That's our forecast in about a year's time. As far as the DXY is concerned, I would actually distinguish between the DXY and the broad dollar index, the BBDXY. So for the DXY, um, I'm actually not that bearish um, because, you know, like I said, I, don't, I, I think the Fed has shifted from being preemptive in terms of their monetary policy to being more reactive. So I think they're comfortable with the level of real rates as it stands, and they probably don't want to compress it a lot further. So I think the whole real rate Fed easing argument is not something that takes the DXY a lot weaker. Um, and there are kind of other risks that I don't, I don't want to go into on the euro side and the yen side. So I think for the DXY, probably 90. We, we get below 92, which is a very important technical level, but we probably don't go a lot further below that. But BBDXY is a different story. I, I think certainly, as a lot of the panelists have talked about, you know, because you know, the search for yield, recovery and growth, uh, EM currencies and high beta commodity currencies probably do a lot better. So the BBDXY can probably go, go a lot lower, but I don't have a level for you. What are we left with? Dollar rupee? I mean, of course, you know, we know the BOP story, but we also know the RBI's reaction function is very important. But as Sajid said, if the dollar's weakening versus other EM currencies, I think ultimately the central bank will tolerate a somewhat weaker dollar versus the rupee. So our forecast is 7150 um, in a year's time. And we're left with one more thing. Nifty, I, I have no clue. I, I mean, I'd just say <laughs> the, the level we're at now. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I asked for Nifty is I have no clue either. I was hoping you, you would give me some. None answer. of us do. Pranjal, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. You, you, did, you did mention that buzz off was also an answer, but you know, let me try not to use it. So on the rupee, uh, one year ahead, of, you know, closer to the 71 level, uh, that was the level pre-COVID. And it also, you know, the, the appreciating bias that I discussed a while ago, it sort of also chimes with that. On the 10-year uh, GSEC for India, we have it at 6.3, uh, one year ahead. Fiscal pressures could only last. Monetary policy easing has been front-loaded to a large extent, and inflation fears can't really be ignored. On the Nifty, you know, limited upside from here, but, uh, you know, as our equity strategist puts it, could be opportunities from sector-wide rotation, figure that out. And on the DXY, you know, stable to gradually weakening, you know, possibly aligned with what others have also said. Thanks a lot, Pranjal. Really appreciate it. Samir, you're next. Also, an extra one for the CNY. Uh, it's been kind of, dollar CNY has been coming down quite rapidly, so if you can add that to the mix, that would be great. Sure, sure. I I'll start with the dollar there because that's probably where just that bit of difference is. I think I'll be a lot more bearish on the dollar. I think it's one of the worst policy mix the U.S. has had. The dollar exceptionalism is gone. And I think if Biden comes in, I think we will just only add to that trend. I would say 5 to 6% lower 
on the DXY, probably back to at least the kind of levels we see early 2018, maybe even further lower. Uh, in INR is complicated in that context. I would probably uh, sort of uh, put out the limb to say flat to maybe even a couple of percent weaker than the dollar, but probably what will be much more aggressive is a lot more weaker versus, for example, the euro or the yen. We think euro will be at 125 end of next year. We think dollar yen will be at 100 next year. Dollar China, uh, I think, uh, I mean, again, dollar China, mind you, is a very policy controlled currency. So it's always trickier, but I would say six half rather than seven. So uh, we're, we're looking definitely for dollar China lower. Uh, go. GSEC yields, like I mentioned earlier, I think next three to six months, RBI holds the line, but eventually it lets go. We should be at six half at this point next year. And what, yes, nifty, like with others, I have no idea, but I think what fits together though, to square the circle with the other parts of the narrative, like Sajid said, should probably mean uh, nifty five to 10% uh, stronger than where we are right now. Only that story should fit a probably a positive sort of reflationary story. So it's a, it's a good reflationary story. Should it help us lift being higher, not that we have any particular focus on that. Superb. Thank you to all four of you. You were fantastic. I learned a lot personally. Uh, I was trying to take, take notes on the side, but uh, wasn't doing a great job. Uh, I'm going to give the closing uh, predictions to Tiagu, sir, and then you can close the conference or we we'll take it to the next uh, session, please. Tiagu, sir, all yours. Anand, you have succeeded in getting some forecast from economists, actually. That itself is a big, <laughs> <laughs> big takeaway from this panel discussion. Anyway, I don't think actually it's going to be some sort of a broad K actually, basically, everywhere. Actually. Let it be economy, let it be currencies actually. I don't think if dollar is going to be weak, you cannot expect dollar to be weak across the board actually. That's a basic point actually. So that the currencies with the higher growth, naturally you are going to have a stronger currency. So naturally, in that case actually China could be going in a different way and the rest of the Asia could be going in a different way actually. That's the point. And then people have lost so much of money betting on a weaker dollar for the last 10 years, actually. I don't know why Samir is betting on a weaker dollar in the next 10 years, actually. I'm <laughs> sorry, Samir. We will exchange notes at the end of next year and then we will see dollar either staying here or a bit stronger, actually. Of course, I will continue to stay. Absolutely, sir. And then possibly a stronger dollar, whether Biden comes or uh, Trump comes, or I don't think it would make any big difference as per the, the structural story of US is concerned. As Sajid was putting up, possibly U.S. growth that is going to be that, that is going to be deciding actually. The U.S. and China could be growing in 2021, whereas the rest of the world is not going to grow. So to that extent, actually, you can derive where the currencies would be. That's a basic point. And one thing, actually, possibly the economists across the world, they are all under underappreciating the importance of inflation. Actually, possibly the millionaires, possibly I think they will forget the name word inflation actually, and uh, Maybe I think the return of inflation is going to be marked 2021. In that case, naturally the yields are going to be higher across the board. So dollar at about let's say 100 dollar index, and then dollar rupee maybe a 75 R. Yes, and then of course the balance sheet. Huh? You please. Huh? Balance sheet is there on 31st March. So 75 65 is the previous balance sheet rate. So we have to be careful about it. So that apart, actually I think a dollar is going to stay either in possibly stronger actually. And then equities, I suppose actually, see another K, K type of uh, asset story actually. Sector rotation as Pranjul said. So. Yeah. Uh, maybe I think, I think we are not going to breach the historic high. Super. That's a few call at this point, but still. Oh, fantastic. It's, uh, always, uh, we all live in the hope that everybody has a poor memory and nobody remembers what we said one year back. But uh, superb. Um, Sajid, Pranjul, Adarsh, Samir, this was fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Thiago, sir, and SYFX for arranging such a lovely panel. I learned a lot, discussed a lot. We could go on forever, but uh, we've taken up everybody's time anyway. So back to you, Thiago, sir, and thanks, everybody. Thank you.